I love that intro so much. It's such a good so intro. I'm not over it. I'm quite pleased. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, the Wednesday Club. It is Wednesday at noon where we are. God only knows what time it is where you are. Uh, today... <laughs> it could be any number of times, really. It, it's it's all times at once because time is an illusion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so link up to next week. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. It's it's uh, the Image so, Comics episode. Suddenly I wanted to start quoting uh, The Watchmen. Oh, uh, at I'm on Mars. I'm on Mars. I'm not on Mars. I'm in the past. I'm in the future. That's, yeah. gonna, that's actually you know gonna, that's gonna come it up. It blew my mind. Okay. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's gonna come yeah. up. Okay. I was saying it blew my. It, just, it continually blows my mind every time I realize that Doctor Manhattan sees the world as a comic book. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Makes you think. So yeah. Makes you think. All right. We'll have to get into. So who's this amazing lady, by the way? Hello. I'm Amy Dallin, and this is Matt Key, and this is Talis and Jaffe, and who is this phenomenal creature? Hello, everybody. I'm Erica Isha. You may know me from other shows all on <laughs> Geek and Sundry. Uh, it's, I'm so incredibly honored to be here. I, I'm the first guest. First, first guest. First guest. First guest. First guest. First and guest. I get to talk about, um, I, I love comics, uh, and <laughs> I am reading I think, ex with the exception of Lumberjanes, exclusively Image Comics right now. And today we're talking about Image Comics, so I can just mm. gush about how much I love Image Comics. And it's your birthday! Happy birthday! Oh, birthday! Yeah, it was birthday my birthday week. yesterday, birthday and, and um, Talison got me a cake pop, a birthday cake pop, which uh, he he knows is my favorite kind of cake pop. A, we had a very long car ride back from Comic Con a few years ago, and we had a long talks. It, it was great. <laughs> it was good. Super mm. good. All right. Uh, well, uh, kick us, kick us off, Dallas. I'm kicking yeah. off. Well, there's a few things. Uh, we're doing a couple, a couple weird format things for today that are special just for today. We're raising money for 826LA. Woo! Uh, which, if you're a Critical Role fan, you know we love 826LA. It's a charity that helps uh, tutor uh, children who might have a difficult time getting access to these, uh, to those sorts of. Uh, People and help them with creative writing, poetry, uh, critical thinking, because uh, smart kids make for smart adults. Uh, and yeah, and uh, you've done some, and they've got these really cool storefronts. Uh, right, they, yeah, so they, yeah. they have stores all across the country where, like, the one here uh, is themed as Time Traveler, I believe. The Time mm -hmm. Travel oh, Mart. Uh, and so the, the Time Travel Mart, right, they so have Time Travel Sickness Pills and Mammoth Meat and Canned Toga, apparently. I like the, Robot like, emotions. fake wine bottles that, like, it's like Essence of Romanticism. It's different eras. Mm -hmm. um, I like that one. Aww. Old English gunpowder. <laughs> one of them. So they promote the importance of story storytelling and uh, stories uh, and with their charity and we here at Geek and Sundry feel that it is extremely important. So during our anniversary week we are raising money for them. We've already raised over two thousand dollars. Which is crazy. Mm -hmm. We yes. haven't even started yet guys. But <laughs> you're so awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so thank you. So we're going to be doing a weird thing that we don't normally do. Normally what happens is since we uh, find that it's a little easier to do this show if we can't see chat moving at a million miles a second uh, in our peripheral. We normally get um, a. <laughs> they're, they're mocking us on the screen. We normally get a curated view of like people's questions so that we don't miss you and so that we can actually see things coming up. But for today and today only, um, it will require a ten dollar donation to eight two six if you want to send us a question. But we will be like that means also that the question list will not be moving at the speed of light either. So if you want to ask us anything. It's a ten dollar donation to eight two six, and they're super cool, and mm -hmm. that makes everybody everybody happy. And, and we may catch other comments, but that's like a guaranteed way to support a good cause oh, yeah. and put your question yes. in front of us. Yeah, we're also we have the chat up too, just so we can be a little bit like if you want your question to get through. This uh, is amazing. Uh, somebody responded. Star Pilot Six responded to us going like, "Who is this?" And Star Pilot Six says, "She's the girl that ate a spider for freedom." <laughs> that, what? Okay, very quick, very quick. What? Catch up, catch up. Uh, so over the weekend, I had a 24-hour uh, birthday uh, stream on my Twitch channel. And I was raising money for the ACLU, and I said, ha ha ha, if we get to $10,000, I'll eat a zebra tarantula. Ha 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 ha. Turns good. out we did. We did, <laughs> uh, because this community is mind-blowingly incredible and generous and supportive. And I, true to my word, I ate a zebra tarantula. It was dead already. I don't know why people assume that it was it alive. It sounds like it's alive. I don't I know guess. why. When you say you eat a tarantula, where, it sounds like it was did alive. did you have a zebra? Like, did someone just send you? A zebra tarantula? Oh, yes, it's Pandar did. Thanks, it's Pandar. It's Pandar sent me a bunch of like chocolate covered bugs, except the spider was just had a little bit of salt on it and yeah. it was just a dead spider. Dead spider. I All ate right. it. I ate All it. Right. Um, and ACLU gave us some retweet love. Uh, Aww, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, which was wonderful. And, and I just, again, thank you. I cannot thank you all enough for opening up your hearts and your wallets for freedom. 
Thank you and making me eat spider. Opening your mouth. <laughs> and, uh, and slowly chewing and macerating appropriately. I love you. <laughs> um, Open your mouth for freedom. The, the, the last Tell us the death. Welcome. What is spider in it? Would, That's would the that, other half. Would that be like uh, arach, arachnid mastication? Like? Arach, arach, yes. Arachnid mastication. Oh, yeah. yeah. Never mind. Arach, yeah. Arachnid mastication. Everybody at home say ACLU that three times fast. ACLU mastication. Yeah. That's the new has- <laughs> hashtag. ACLU arachnid mastication. mastication. <laughs> hashtag. Uh, we're also going to be popping to the Nerdist News to talk the, to them about Mark Madness. We're having a quick. crossover. We're having a crossover because we have this Which is my favorite comic. Crossover yeah. wars. Yeah. It's a thing that Image doesn't do, which is ironic. <laughs> well, very rarely. Sometimes. But yeah, it's just because we have this tech and we want to play with it and we figured we play with it here because we're yeah. fun. Yeah. And our disasters are amusing. What the heck is it? Where did this yeah. come yeah. from? Yeah. Can, can win? Can win. Can win. Uh, it works in this again. building, apparently. Yeah, so there's so there's there's a lot happening here. There's there's a spawn who we'll talk about, and over over here, you know who that is. Oh yeah. yeah. From Saga. From Saga. And then and then celebrating celebrating the rebirth of image, which we will get into, we have a zombie at the at the oh. other side. It's like three years of, of image three years of condensed image. into one beautiful image I, by Ken Wynn. Beautiful. Does he I, I we, we gotta ask him if he has some, like an Instagram, Instagram yeah. or something like know. that. Oh I'll bug him about it when we uh, he had to go back to work. Also we're all wearing red. Wearing red. Oh, that's a faux pas. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one of us has to go home and change. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, we're running for, for a very cool reason. It's International Women's Day. If I had been thinking, it would have been a Vertigo episode, but didn't think that through. Just not, we don't think Amazing that. side uh, news, by the way. I know yes. we don't cover breaking news, but it is now official. Mm. Both of the ex-executive editors of Vertigo, two women who profoundly changed comics as we know them, uh, Karen Berger and then Shelley Bond, have now both landed at other comic book companies with their own imprints. So wow. Karen Berger's Burger Books will be coming out from Dark Horse and announced this weekend at Emerald City, Shelley Bond is going to have her own imprint at IDW. No kidding! Um, so Whoa. I'm so excited for that, because uh, like these women made comics what they are, mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing. If you like uh, Sandman or Fables or Watchmen or like a Invisibles lot of things. Or I remember uh, Shade or... I've never back heard of any of those. <laughs> uh, yeah, back in middle school, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, superstar Neil Gaiman, uh, would thank her, uh, Karen Berger in all of his forewords for mm -hmm. Sandman. Mm -hmm. And I just remember reading her name and thinking, wow, who is this woman? Yes, the she, wizard behind the shadows. Yeah, no, she was definitely the power behind like 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 all of the of the of the alt comic revolution of the of the nineties was really it was her. It was pretty much her. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's a great story that we will definitely Cover. But today we're covering the other great revolution of the 90s. Yes, the, the bro revolution, which was a little ridiculous. <laughs> Bro-volution? Bro-volution, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so Talison sent us this uh, amazing documentary on Image Comics, uh, and, and it's like about its inception and, and the history of it. And I, start, and I was watching it, and, and about like 15 minutes in or something, uh, I hear a familiar voice and Talos and Jaffe pops up and I was like, uh -huh. wait, uh -huh. we all wait a minute. Wait a minute. We all had that. We all had that moment. Yep. Yeah, so so after this episode, if you're in the mood, you can watch uh, the image revolution for free on Amazon Prime. I highly recommend it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a great documentary, and, and I did kind of forget that I'm in it. I'm really sorry. Oh, I just forgot no. that I assigned <laughs> you all something mandatory to watch that I yeah, was in. I, I, Brittany and I watched it together uh, and I texted texted, I think I texted you both, and yeah. I was like, Oh, Talison! Uh, you failed to you you failed to mention did, that you were in I this. I did uh, fail to mention. Uh, yeah, there will be a link to. They'll, 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 I'll be we'll be tweeting out a link to watch it on Amazon Prime. But it's a really good documentary. It um, is. Yeah. It covers the yeah. company Image Comics, which has is turning twenty five years old right now. Uh, the sort of baby upstart comic company. Like there there have been many actually significant ones in the last ten to fifteen years, but Image still feels like a new kid on the block in a way mm. compared to the big two, which have these seventy five year histories. Uh, and uh, the, boy, it's quite a history, isn't it? It is. It's yeah. They are the comic book store that like like in the comic book uh, uh, imprint that like is at the you know they're twenty five. They're at kind of they're getting close to their ten year reunion in high school, and they're like, I look good. I look really. Good. <laughs> I look like yeah. I still look like I'm like maybe like nineteen twenty one. I've been working out. I'm and that's well. the the interesting thing is like image turned out real good. Uh, yeah. And what's what's interesting is that like they this is a, an independent publisher founded in the early nineties. That was, I, this is what's fascinating to me. It was phenomenally popular and successful from the outset, but beset by some like creative and business problems as they went forward. Uh, 
And, and the, the most fascinating thing to me, and this is going to be a your mileage may vary scenario, is a lot of the like early image hits, they don't really speak to me personally. Like a lot of those <laughs> artists, true. despite being like the superstars, like the unquestioned superstars of their time, they weren't a lot of the ones that speak to me most. But the thing they created by going independent and making their own company has reshaped the image, the, the industry. And now we find ourselves at this place like in 2017, where as you said, like you can easily, this is a stack of, I brought, uh, Image has been doing, a lot of companies have been doing these $1 reprints of issue ones. Oh, um, I oh, would no, love no, we, no, 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 we got a, we got a, we got a thing. I, and oh, we'll run back through some of these, but here is the ones that we randomly had on hand from oh current Image Comics. Is that with my my pull too, or that is that all of these us? These are that's, just that's the ones just, I brought. Oh, just Paper the ones girls. you brought. Paper Girls is on Rat that. Queens. Rat Queens, I love. Southern Bastards. Bastards. Monstrous. Boom. Outcast. Oh man. The Wicked and the Divine. I'm Sex. reading that one. Black Science. Yes. Velvet. It's fun. I Kill Giants. I read it. Nowhere Men. On the I've heard that one too. Saga. Saga, little oh, baby. Low. This is a bunch of Rick Remender books. Uh, he's got his own like wing of image now. Fatal. So good. East of West. So good. Bitch Planet. Oh, oh I love Planet. that one. That's a purple Lazarus. one for today. Lazarus Sex, Sex Criminals. criminals. Uh, Phonogram, which has their own $1 reprint here. And, and Descender, like, there's so much more. These are literally just the issue ones from the last couple years that I had on hand at the shop when I was yeah. gathering can, things can, up. Can you pull from my, the, my, the, the occult asshole brain inside oh, of my and head? Was, like, was that Thieven that they were using as the, as the fake, fake magic term? <laughs> oh, very um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, think I know that fake, I know that fake, uh, fake language. This oh, one? Yeah. Is that Thieven? Have it looks you read like Thieven. I love Thieven. Oh, okay, oh, God, I was yeah. gonna say, like, I, I assume oh. you've... <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's, it was interesting re watching the documentary and realizing that all seven of the founders of Image came from Marvel. They were the top sellers yeah. of their time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, here I'll, I'll look. This is this is. Yeah. Well, like, well, we can do an quick, in a quick nutshell. Recap. I can do. An, I can do in a. Also, I think your chat is broken. In a nutshell, I think my chat is broken too. It just won't look. Chat, you're broken. We're, we're, sorry, guys. We broke the chat. We broke chat. It's awesome. It's okay. It's all gonna work out. Uh, they'll they'll send us things. Yeah. Um, so. I'm sure you, and you'll notice watching this show that we talk a lot about people who wear capes and spandex. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about capes and spandex because of due to due to a a weird thing that happened in the '50s that we will get into. Yeah, that has something to do with our logo. Um, all the comic books that were being published that were not capes and spandex kind of died. Uh, there was a weird push for censorship. Things things went bad, and there was this very very. Uh, robust industry that had romance comics, western comics, horror mm -hmm. comics, detective and detective yeah. like everything just withered and died really really quickly leaving this tiny little sliver of it. If you can imagine it was like a movie industry where like due to some weird haphazard thing that happened one year every studio decided they were going to do nothing but make pirate movies. And 30 20 30 years into that we're just getting 10 new pirate movies every year. And that's what so movies are. They're movies about people on boats with beards and swords. And we all associate movies with pirates. This like, is a great analogy. What, and what an interesting way to do a pirate movie. Now we're doing like kind of a space pirate movie, and then we're going to do like like every movie's a pirate movie. And at some point, you're like, I want to make. A, but they all have eye patches and 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 peg and legs, legs. And right? Holes. And they're and sailing does, something. According to this analogy, it would be behoove us to point out that like at that point where there were only pirate movies beginning to be made, a couple of geniuses made amazing pirate Some really movies good made people want to make yeah. pirate movies, right? But, it's really but, dark stuff. So, so we ended up with these two behemoths, Marvel and DC, and they basically make superhero books, and and that's kind of that's kind of where we were. And we had and we have this generation of kids who are basically you either work for Marvel or DC, or you and, and make a living, or you independently produce your own comic and hope you live. Which, granted, yeah. some people were doing, but they were yeah. sort of squeaking by. There's a, a parallel trend that we'll get into later, where mm. like th this, there there hasn't always been such a thing as a comic book store. Um, the idea yeah. of a specialty store that mostly sold comics is what's called the direct market. And it really only arose in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and it allowed some of these like weird creative comics to flourish. And so we wouldn't have, like there was a, what they call the black and white comics revolution in the 80s where you had things like Love and Rockets telling mm. slice of life oh, yeah. stories. And then Usagi Ujimbo, of course, telling weird rabbit samurai stories. Right. Milk and uh, cheese. Milk and cheese. <laughs> and a, a couple little guys named known as the Ninja Turtles. Um, but there, there hadn't been this thing of like, Cracking a mass market for this outside the box stuff, and and Marvel Marvel was I mean Marvel was churning through people DC churned through people creative creative talent and they were real businesses and even from the get go from day one uh, the guys that actually that did the the grunt work and created Captain America Spider Man 
uh, uh, like all of the Avengers, all the Justice and League. Superman. On Superman. the other side, Superman yeah. and any of the big DC heroes. Uh, there, yeah, there's a... Yeah, the, like this, the the poor creators of Superman did not did not. They, they sold not the rights to well. Superman for one hundred thirty dollars. Yeah, and uh, then when the film was they coming got, out, yeah. they got a, a twenty thousand dollars a year pension because because they they publicly uh, this is a little apocryphal. I, I want to source this. Yeah. I'm going to say it anyway because it's a good story. That um, one of one of the guys was working in Westwood when when uh, I don't remember which one when the movie came out and got interviewed like by E Entertainment. Yeah. Like, yeah, they had this big, and when Superman the movie came out, there was this big Superman statue on top of the Fox Theater. I remember it well. And it was a big to-do, and he they interviewed him on like on the red carpet, and he's like, yeah, it's amazing that this thing that I wrote when I was a kid is now this whole thing. And they're like, oh, you're going to see the movie? He's like, oh, no, no, I, I, I'm, I, I'm working down the street. Uh, I just was walking by and was like, whoa. And, the, and it just humiliated DC so much that they were, like, scrambled to fix it. And would, do, was it Neil Adams who... Like really like champion those rights and like really like help push that through with like DC because he was, was like, a lot, he was of, people. A lot of slow book. fighting behind the scenes. Yeah. There were folks like Neil Adams and, and actually Frank Miller who mm. were like made serious pushes for this. Uh, one of the most famous examples of like later creators coming in and like wanting better deals was of course Alan Moore with Watchmen. Yeah, uh, and the oh, the God. famous story there is that Alan Moore was supposed to get the rights to Watchmen back as soon as it went out of print because back then nothing stayed in print. That wasn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and there are conflicting versions of this story, but essentially you can look back at it and go, whether or not the deal he signed was fair or what he thought he was signing, the book has of course remained in print to this day. Yeah, Alan never... Moore has never gotten the rights back to Watchmen, uh, and he never will. Well, I am uh, so furious about the movie. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, rightly so. Yeah, and, and it's... It got some things right, but, but like he, so he became, he was one of those like superstar creators who was burned out, and this was in the mid 80s. So you can see these, these creative battles are coming to a head, and there's new generations of creators coming in who don't want to be trapped in the same bad deals that had poisoned the lives of Siegel and Schuster, or in the case of like Jack Kirby, mm -hmm. uh, and like. Or Bill Finger, yeah. or like any of those guys who like really created these worlds and were getting no credit for it. So this push was, was happening. Um, in interesting ways, and and one thing that I, I desperately want to know this when we eventually get to a Vertigo episode, this was the DC imprint that sort of mm. picked up with a lot of Alan Moore stuff and introduced him, and the deals were better on those. They were closer to creator-owned comics. I don't know how close, and I'm very curious now, um, but like, what hadn't happened yet was sort of a, a, a total high-profile break with that system of creating things that would be owned by these larger companies, mm -hmm. and it came in the form of. Well, yeah, I mean, these kids were getting into. And by the way, uh, we just just to say, uh, um, uh, uh, Jinquisitor says happy, uh, happy to donate, uh, and, oh. and there, and also uh, we just reminded everyone, Rat Queens is back. How excited are we? I know. I'm so excited. <laughs> we actually pay her to be excited for oh. us. <laughs> Uh, I just don't have Suckers time. Suckers, I could have done it for free. Oh, I would pay you. You get, oh you get my another God. birthday pop. Well done. <laughs> what, how, do you have them in your pocket, or are you just like... I have mostly candy in my pocket. So <laughs> Nothing uh, weird about that. Nothing weird. Thank you. Nothing weird about that. No. Um, I, am, uh, I am evil Wonka. Uh, so, yeah, which came along. These, yeah. these guys who were coming into the industry and were kind of getting to be hot stuff, and they were seeing how their heroes had been treated, because you know Jack Kirby was getting on, they were like, "Wow, the 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 reward for being really good at this job is to die in poverty." He hadn't uh, died yet, but yes, he hadn't. But he was not. He was Kirby. He was like, Kirby, yeah, he was Kirby still drawing was his not fingers a, to the bone, and mm -hmm. was not a happy guy. And was and like and a lot of these guys are not are very rightly so were not happy with the deal they got. It was a it was a bad deal, and suddenly we were getting out of nowhere. And I think it was because it was such a Marvel was starting to take risks with their art. Some of those risks better than others. Uh, right. There's a whole run of New Mutants where I get a little, where I go like, I'm, wow. We all, we all remember some of the life but, of years. But. We all remember life though. So, well, no, like, the thing is, the thing is, is that suddenly, suddenly these things hit. Okay. 
No, I mean, but like these things suddenly hit and became these guys suddenly realized that that they had followings, that they had fan followings. And they did. They had tremendous, huge fan tremendous followings. Tremendous fan yeah, followings. They, they were rock stars and they were selling mil- they sold a million issues of things. Mm-hmm. Which had mm-hmm. never happened. Yeah. Or hadn't happened in decades. Yeah. Back in the Back 50s in the 50s and or... so on, like millions were a normal number. But like since the sort of shrinking and narrowing of the market and especially the rise of the direct market, Worth you didn't them. see numbers like that. So these and I and I and I feel like they would not object if I refer maybe a couple maybe Eric Larson would but if I refer so, so these five under twenty three or like a couple of like these five young twenties dude bros <laughs> yeah. they were dude bros oh, but yeah. it was it was yeah. it was a nineties more innocent time dude bro. yeah uh, they were kids uh, they were they were kids I mean, they were still goofy comic book lovers but like they were. They were they were, they were young yeah. Yeah. and yeah. they were they were very young. He's saying five. There were seven image Stop founders, seven, but yeah. some of them were sort of like there was one some kind of, of elder statesman among the end, them, yeah. uh, and one like slightly older. It was exactly it was, it was Rob was Liefeld who who many things both positive and negative can be said, but right. especially about his his art style, which which is an acquired taste of best. Distinctive. We should say it is distinctive. Acquired taste of best. You may be familiar with some of these folks because, for instance, Rob Liefeld is the co-creator of the character Deadpool. Mm-hmm. Which I've got to say, I was in Arizona. I was in Arizona when when the, the movie premiered at a comic book shop with him. I have never seen such a delighted face on a man in my. Nah. He was I just he, he was standing in the lobby nice. going. Oh wow! Oh, that's so cool. Well, and he was like he was like tweeting about how he got to be in the movie. Like he had like a very small like he did. He's still he's very like, excited. Oh, you know, like, but, but so part fun. of it is that like he co-created Deadpool, and that didn't make him a millionaire because that's not how it worked. So you no. can sort of see where like that character became immediately very well, popular. To be fair, I also don't know how much he had to do with the fourth wall breaking. It does, but he, very little. But, but, yeah. but that's but, the but, look. But, but, the, but the look, look is his. The, the look, look is, is his. Well, look his is. and Deathstroke. No, but like, <laughs> you know, but like, I mean. <laughs> But like, it, and Spider Man's. And he was like, but, yeah, he made a joke. But I got to talk to him for for one of our uh, geek and sundry, like carnival maybe a couple uh, years back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was actually pretty lovely. But he does tell self deprecatingly the story that he was sort of like. I looked at what McFarlane was doing on Spidey, and I was just like, "Man, you have to work too hard. There's way too many lines here. This is like a much simpler Spidey, and he's got knives. Great, done. That's hilarious." Like, Oh, that's super funny. <laughs> Which is that. a joke, but also a fairly apt description. <laughs> a joke, but is he joking? So, so we Good. had Rob Liefeld. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had Liefeld. We had Todd McFarlane, who's who's uh, kind of the the he's the, be the, the ringleader, the, 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 the crotchety older brother. I say crotchety. He's not crotchety. He's he's a uh, he, he's he, intense. He's the he's Harlan like Ellison of comic books. Oh. He's got a, a shark like oh. energy to him. He does, and like he's like, I think like one of his biggest strengths is one of his biggest weaknesses, and that is like. How no nonsense he is, and how focused he he is. Like he's like, no, you're screwing us over, and screw you, and we're leaving. And there's like no middle ground there. Yeah. And, like, and I love I I love that, but there's also something that's like, no, okay. Well, like, so you may know Tom McFarlane as the creator. Uh, we'll get to it in a bit of Spawn, but he also had been doing a massively well-selling run on Spider-Man at the time, and those issues still book for many people. Love some of well, so yeah. Some. And he he's the one who's so oftentimes accredited with the uh, spaghetti web, spaghetti yeah. webs, which is <laughs> the funny right, looking, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. weird looking Spider-Man webs. It's like, why is it not just a cord? Yeah, because like, because like Ditko always had like the net, you know, or whatever else, and a lot of the other artists had done that too. And his point was but always his like, was like but no, I want, I want I want it. Uh, I want it to look like it can fly at the, at the panel. Like I want it to look like it can fly you at the d- panel. You do actually. You do a pretty good. That's a pretty good invitation. Is it? I was afraid it's I sound least... a little bit more like Kermit. No, it's I, well, it's, it's, there's a little bit of George Lucas in there. A oh, little bit. Oh, oh, but... And George then Lucas. Jim Lee, who is who is just this <sighs> Jim friggin Lee. Jim Lee, who's this nice, cool guy who basically brought this. He I, made I ca- Gambit. Jim, I call Jim it the fashion aesthetic. The Gambit card. Oh, you can't even see it there. It's too tiny. Well, like we have actually, if you could pull up a Wildcats cover. Pl- no, pl- pl- well, look, coming. I've got I've got Jim Lee. That's too tiny. Right That's there. too tiny. No, but look, there it is. Let's let's have the powers that be pull up a wildcat cover. I'm just saying, we've got Jim Lee X Men cards. He bought, in there. he brought a real like I thought fashion aesthetic. Like he really understood. Like he he I, I certainly have comments and issues with with I won't even say issues. I I love discussing his redesigns of characters, yeah. whether or not I like them or not, and some or what the things I don't. But he definitely understood. He was the first guy to start really. Playing around with the, the traditional costume yeah, and getting weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would say Paul that, Smith yeah. had done a bunch of really interesting work. Like Paul Smith introduced mm-hmm. Mohawk Storm and a bunch of the sort of oh, fashion-y yeah. X-Men in the late '80s. But Jim Lee's redesigns have become terribly iconic, partly through the fact that we discussed a bunch of us got into comics because of X-Men: The Animated Series. Yeah, and they were using designs. the Jim Lee designs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, 
he and his his work has remained tremendously popular. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I could never pronounce this. Uh, Will's Port I can never pronounce Portacio? it. Portacio, thank you. I assume. Uh, Mark Silvestri will just roll through. Who's still doing? Who's still doing the Witchblade book? Eventually mm -hmm. created the Darkness and Witchblade. Uh, Eric Larson, Savage Dragon, which is adorable and awesome. It's one of those guys. Who, he's just been going set. Like, turns out that guy just really wanted to make comics. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is just really. <laughs> Really lovable. He was just like, I can I just make comics forever? That's what I want to do. Uh, and Jim Valentino and those guys, like these, these they were very, very hot in 1991. They all got together and basically quit all at once. Well, they all realized how hot they were and how advantage, like how much, how much they were being they were taken yeah. for advantage. Uh, you know, like, and then all the, the films are coming out. You know, Batman had just come out, and like those guys aren't like. Well, I mean, Bob Kane. I don't even know if he's still around, but like this stuff's coming out. They're getting nothing for it. You know, and they started to realize, like, hey, you, like, uh, as as uh, as McFarland says in the documentary, he's like, can I, can I even just get a free shirt, like, with with <laughs> my, my Spider-Man art, art on it? Yeah. Like, can I even just get a shirt? You know, they weren't no. even doing that, so they they realized, like, we're the ones creating all the work, you're the ones getting all the money, and something about that contract doesn't add up. And when they went like for concessions of some sort, they were told, no, that's not how contracts work. So, like, apparently, like, in one day, all of them together, like, like the guys who were writing, the, like, or drawing, not writing, drawing, like, not, like, An interesting thing the, that you'll note yeah. here is that think, all of these guys, many of them started writing their own comics, but they all had been working as artists, and it is not coincidence, I think, that their company is called Image Comics, uh, which does play into, like, the larger mm -hmm. sort of the things they got right and the things they got mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. So they told the big two, basically, to stuff it, all in one day. <laughs> yeah. This was a pretty Which amazing part of that documentary. That must have been a crazy, because they were, like... The documentary said like they were doing 44 out of 50 <laughs> of the top-selling book covers. Yeah. Or top-selling books. I'm or like, at, 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 at a certain point, the sales chart was like, this many X-Men by Jim Lee, and this many Lifo books, and this many uh, 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 McFarlane's. And, yeah, they mm -hmm. were... I, I remember being heartbroken when they left Marvel, because those were the guys, like, when I first started reading comics... Those were the guys who were doing them. So, like, those were the only names I associated with those books. And, like, I would go get the X-Men just because Jim Lee was drawing it. So when I found out, I think through Wizard Magazine, because the internet didn't exist in 1991. Oh, Wizard uh, Magazine. Uh, when I found out through Wizard that they had started Image, there was part of me was like, that sounds amazing. So they're not doing Spider-Man and the X-Men anymore? Like, what are we... What are we gonna do? What's gonna happen is we panic. Don't do? catch the streets. Yeah, can you imagine being in those offices when those talks happened? Oh my god! It was. It was. I mean, I no. I don't think. I like. There's no company had ever experienced a creative drain like that before, yeah. where just suddenly you wake up and they're all gone. It's. 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 It's like. It's. It's. I mean, if. If you were running a McDonald's and one day you woke up and there was just no bread anymore, you're like, there's uh, just like all the buns are gone. Figure out what you're gonna do for the like. Are they? They're never coming back. <laughs> so ever, they, they panicked. They make their own bread store. Yeah. That's actually a good analogy because they still you're had the really, meat. You're just full they just of had no analogies. way to deliver the meat. Yeah. 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 And, we and still have Spider Man, but there's no way for you to see him right now. And you have really good analogies. I'm, a, I'm an analogy man. That's kind of cool. Like the a analogy shark. king. Uh, yeah. Also, say we got more happy birthdays for you from my left knee. Oh, oh thank you so much. Uh, Clank Zillid wants to know some of our favorite offbeat comics. Uh, and they like independent comics more than more some of the mainstream stuff. And boy, we're going to be getting into that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, That's the right question to ask for this entire yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. How great is Tess Fowler, one of the artists from Wack Queens, legendary critter fan? What other comics has she done that you would recommend? Tess Fowler is super great. She's super great. Yeah. That would be the answer to that. Uh, she's she's done lots of little bits and pieces all over the place. She's working on something new that I'm always excited when I see. Yeah. It. Oh, my so, God. So. She's working on a, a sort of futuristic <laughs> space thing that I read. I don't know what it I, is I, yet. I, yeah. But I'm really excited about it. I'm super excited it. for that. But she's done little stunts. She's, she's done some, some Wonder Woman. Art that I love, I love. She's mm -hmm. got a couple. Mm -hmm. This was the, uh, the the question that came in from Jingle. Oh, she did some Wizard bombshell Jingle Jingle stuff. Uh -huh. The DC bombshells, you know, where the where the gals are in like World War II era yeah. outfits. Those and covers were all gorgeous. Yeah, and the book they made out of it is just twenty times as good as it should be. I, really? Like, really? So good. Yeah, you like Marguerite it. Bennett writes that book, and she was just like, I'm going to take this premise, and you know how I could just phone this in? What if instead I created I'm a beautiful like, alt-history version of World War II that would be the most fun and the most dramatic? There's, and, like, how great really story really points good. in there, and it's funny because, like, it's based on a line of... Uh, Figurines, essentially. They were just like, "Oh, this will look cool." They're yeah, the well, 40s. they look cute. And they did look cool. The 40s? But that could have been it. 
What, that what, what, what if we would made have plastic it. replicas of cheesecake and charged two hundred dollars exactly. a pop for them? The book. <laughs> Except it worked. Good. Like should not have worked. Should not worked have worked spectacularly. Yeah. I want to marry every cover on this. Oh, books. they're so pretty. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> The cosplay out of that, though. Oh. Okay, but we need more Tesla so, Rex because yeah, you, and this is she. Well, I don't know whether she, she, to get into this. We're all very happy Rat Queens is back, but support Tess Fowler and all her work. She was oh, the artist for a while, you can, and you there can, was some like behind the scenes you, stuff you, that you, I'm not. You can no, but you, you can but, be. A, I, I feel like you can be a fan of Rat Queens and a fan of Tess, and it's not necessarily mutually ex you, yeah. like like many things. I can yeah. There's there's yeah. That's yeah, it's yeah. I don't know any of the image founders. Oh <laughs> yeah. Well. I don't know any of the business behind that, but I just know I love Tess Fowler's work. Yeah. Uh, my friend actually uh, used some of her comic panels on her shoes for her wedding. Oh. She had a book themed wedding, and she like paper mache like rat queens art onto there. So, that's so cool. as yeah, as but, we say, that's man, that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get Tess. there. Uh, so these twenty something while we while we dig a couple up because she does a lot of single issue Ooh, stuff. Rascalscomic.com uh, uh, is a good site to go to to see her stuff. While we while we while these twenty something dude bros and they are dude bros are suddenly except Jim Valentino except who's like Jim. their elder statesman kind of trying to be I like, know, I so I've been around all. in comics and we could do this and they're like ah! <laughs> this is my impression of what they're, I've they're <laughs> dead on dead on <laughs> they're artists drawing their, they're writing their own books and if they're about as I mean. They're artists writing their own books for whatever In that's some cases worth. it worked. Like Eric Larson writes and draws Savage Dragon to this mm -hmm. day. And uh, it's very which solid. Which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Like everything mm -hmm. else has renumbered. Everything else has gone back. And weirdly Spawn and Savage Dragon are the two books just chugging along. Like nobody's business. Uh, Spawn is now sort of overseen by McFarlane, but mostly drawn yeah. by other people. But, yeah, he, he, he's kind of backed away from it a bit from what I understand because he wants to make toys and I respect that. Yeah. Right. He makes nice toys. He does. Uh, they're good toys. They're very good toys. <laughs> so I, I interrupted you. No, no, no. Uh, well, we're, we're welcome to the tangent show. This is the <laughs> tangent episode. Yeah. So these guys. Yes, yeah, this one. This these is guys yeah. started just putting this time. just this one. They started making these books, and they these books were selling like hotcakes for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and in part, we, we should one of those variety of reasons that they'll get into is that this was a period where speculation became a huge deal in comics, um, sort of for the worse in the long term. What, what, yeah. what, what is what is speculation? Of, yes. I hear myself asking. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, good point. I, this, I did it this time. Uh, speculation, <sighs> buying comics as investments is not a bad thing. But when it gets out of hand, you get people, uh, like any other speculation boom around land or like what was the tulip boom that nearly yep. crashed mm -hmm. Holland? Mm -hmm. like, right, um, yes. When, when people start chasing something that they think is gonna make them a lot of money, it distorts markets, it distorts value. Uh, and in this case, what you got in the late 80s, early 90s was the fact that Silver Age comics were starting to appreciate because they were starting to be appreciated. People were like, maybe we shouldn't have wrapped our lunches in Fantastic Four number one. And there's, <laughs> and there's only kind of wish I had one there's of There's only a hundred copies running around, yeah. and I kind of want one, and I'm uh, I have the money to spend on it. And this is the side of comic book investing that I love, where you sort of track down these things that weren't appreciated in their time, and you like give them good homes and and appreciate what they are worth. And they do that. Some of them are now terribly expensive because mm -hmm. there aren't very many of them, and a lot of people want them. Mm -hmm. But in getting aware that comics could be worth money. You got to a lot of, I'm going to try to guess that this one is going to be the one that's worth a lot of money. So because these guys, the Image Founders, were so hot, uh, partly based on the fact that like they, they did things they hadn't done before. They put X-Men back to issue one. This was at a time where you didn't do that. X-Men mm -hmm. had been running mm -hmm. for since the 60s. 60s yeah. uh, and it, it, they didn't even remember when they went into reruns. Uh -huh. um, but they were like, it's an X-Men number one. And everybody knew that the 60s X-Men number one was worth a lot of money, so why wouldn't this one be worth a lot and of money? And they did four variant covers and of they, it. So, so they took advantage of that. They were like, five different covers or four different four covers different or whatever covers. it was. And they all connect, and they're all done by Jim Lee, and this guy's amazing. So the thing is that that comic sold millions of copies, but because there are millions of them out there and not that much time has passed since the early 90s, and because most people who bought it expected to keep and hold it, they're only worth a couple bucks now. If yeah. even. Because this is a result of, like, it's not scarce, and nobody, like, we're starting to get to the point. We're starting to get to the point where people who did get rid of their comics from the early 90s miss them and go back and get them. So comics that essentially became quarter-bin comics are graduating to, like, two and three dollar comics. 
Uh, but like, it's taken this long, 25 years, for, for that to start happening. So in the meantime, you get these comics that people are buying 10 or 20 or 50 copies of. My boss at the shop, we should have brought him in for this. He, his, we turned 25 last year. So their early days as a comic book store Oof. were this sort of like, this weird feeling as they would sell 50 copies of Spawn number one wow. to someone. Just knowing that that wasn't going to pay off, but that you don't, you don't want to be like, you can't, I'm not going to sell you those. Yeah. Like, but, no, but, you, but, but it, like, but like that, if you see the documentary, that line, the golden apple for people lining yeah. up, I, me and my, my high school friends are in that line. That's amazing. Like, wow. That's amazing. Oh. The excitement is amazing to me. Real excitement for comics is amazing. And I always worry when I start ranting about speculators and no, it's stuff true. That, like, it's I'm because shitting on actual excitement, but no, no, no. I, I mean a lot of, and if people are buying it for that reason, it's, you know, it, it, does when it starts to influence the way that other people who really do appreciate are enjoying it, it's not good. Hey, we, and it's I, not sustainable. Like, yeah. It's not yes, it's not sustainable true. and I, I think like I, I see like sort of and I, I might get murdered for this I uh, but I I feel like there's a parallel between uh put the not yet <laughs> not yet not yet. Uh I feel like there's a parallel between what people a lot of people say killed like Comic Con with like um uh, Twilight coming in. It's like no, no, but this is for comic books. It's the same as like speculators and lovers of the medium. It's like, mm. no, 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 but this is, we, we want to love the medium. Like, just let us read our comics. Don't continue to pump stuff in here that doesn't necessarily Although, belong because you're going to generate more income or whatever else. Like, maybe the, it's not, I'm not an analogy. No, king. I mean, no, like, well, I, I, would, like, I would actually say proper, there might be but. more parallels uh, to that than just that because in a way I have enjoyed the growth of Comic Con because it means that more people do discover um, artists and comics that are exciting. Uh, they get into this culture that they didn't think was for them because they went there to see Twilight or something. Them, yeah. yeah, and they're like, oh, I do like comics because uh, I've, I've seen that happen. Uh, and and just like with that, like now I can go buy an a comic that I remember from my old days, and I don't have to pay like five hundred dollars. That's for true, it. and mm -hmm. you you so get the fact accessibility that accessibility like, is good. I think news stories about the massive sellouts <laughs> got people into the stores. It did, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and then. But like there are substantial like I'm 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 kind of okay. I I'm a Twilight backlash backlasher, so I can't let it just go by because part of it was like I, I that backlash was gendered in a way that sucks. Mm -hmm. That I think we all agree. Like yeah, young women are I, often told that the things they like are dumb. I, I will yeah. I will I will also say one of my favorite T-shirts I ever saw at, at at which was which was kind of a nice little smirk was a, a friend my friend Danielle had a T-shirt that just said. Battlestar Galactica, when you're ready for the next Edward. And I was like, <laughs> yay. <laughs> well, and it, I get a lot of the criticisms of the Twilight franchise are super valid, but it is uh, weird where people were like, this doesn't belong mm -hmm. at Comic Con, where it's like, neither did Star Wars, which was some random sci fi movie they were hoping people would like in 1976 at Comic Con. Comic Con, there's never been a time where it was literally just comics. You're just mad that this other thing is popular. Yeah. You're not mad that the other thing is here, you're mad that too many people like it. And that's a different kind of being mad. Yeah, and that, and, and, but anyway. and, and that was a Free big Jamie. that was but no, but that was a big problem for a long time because because the comic book stores definitely did bunker people, which is why it's so hard to read them now. I know it sounds like we have like rats in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a, we got a question from Dark Aardvark. What was the first title that drew you into Image Comics? Ooh. I picked up Young Blood number one and Spawn number one, but I, I mean, <laughs> Gen thirteen. Well, we, we'll get to Gen thirteen, but. <laughs> It was really, it was less about the books back then and more about the notion of like a rebellion and counterculture, but like it wasn't real counterculture. It was the 90s. And like it was the it, it, the image of rebellion, the image rebellion. It was very, it was very, you can, it was the Bart Simpson, it was, it was Bart Simpson's Ready? love child with, with, with Marilyn Manson. We're shocking and cool. We skateboard and have backwards hats. And, and you know what's funny about but that? But like, it was like, a thing. I think that's why I rejected it as a kid. A lot of kids did because they, I was they, like, I was like, I don't, I don't need. I just want to read my Spider Man and my X Men. I don't need <laughs> you to like put your backwards hat on and be Poochie from The Simpsons. It was like, so <laughs> Poochie. Right, so right, right, like, right. I felt like they were just like cyber and pouches and military. It was like, uh, okay, cool, I guess. Yeah, I'm just gonna continue to read X Force. Like, so, the truth is, though, I, I'm gonna shout out like I. Art that doesn't necessarily speak to me does speak to other people. And one of my very favorite comics creators right now uh, is Ed Pisker, who does Hip Hop Family Tree, who legit would not be the artist he is if he didn't adore Rob Liefeld. No. To this day. 
loves him. Really? Like, has become a tremendous and amazing, like, he's won awards for Hip Hop Family Tree, which is a wonderful graphic history of hip hop. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it was up for Eisner's. Did it win an Eisner? I can't remember. I think it did. Yeah, because I, I saw him go. Did. He was wearing a t-shirt. It was it great. Did, yeah. Um, he went up and accepted his award in his t-shirt, and he was like, if I thought I Eisner's, won, I wouldn't have worn Fruit of the Loom. Yeah. Eisner's, Eisner's. The Golden Globes of comics. They're also the Oscars. Kinda, are you, they the Oscars? I feel like we, we don't televise. Although, no, you Oscars? had a good one now. We finally had the, we had the we, host. We, like, now yeah, I feel we like had John the Oscars. Yeah. You made it the Oscars. That was pretty cool. But I'm you can just go. You can just yes. walk Sign in up. and you'll get a free, like, Will Eisner <laughs> book. Yes, and this and is a true yeah. fact. It's like yeah. you can just walk in there if you have, and like, just meet your hero. If you have a badge to San Diego, anyone with a badge, you don't have to reserve tickets, you don't have any to pay any money. Any convention in San Diego. Yeah, and uh, it's, floor tiling. Doesn't right. matter. So. I know. And, like, it's like <laughs> after convention hours, so you can just borrow one from, borrow a badge from your friend we don't and walk in. Don't condone it by doing free comics. And, I mean, you know, like, a fruit basket. The room isn't full, guys. The award for comics every year, the room is never full. It is seating. It is crazy. Neil Gaiman gave me a hug at the Eisner Awards. It is empty. I just walked in. I got to shake hands with Jason Aaron and say thank you for Doctor Strange, and he stared at me awkwardly like, who are you? Get away from me. But it was worth it. It's just comics, people. They just look like that. No, sure, sure. (laughs) But, like, I I will admit, like, when I did the Eisners, like, uh, like, and by did, I wrote, like, lines for John Barrowman to say, which was awesome, and and helped him choose costumes. Nerd. Total nerd (laughs) over here. Uh, And, like, what was the the best thing about that that was that I was getting paid to read all the books that I hadn't had a chance to read yet. Nice. Because, like, I I had to know, like, Every single nominee, what they were about, because I had to be able to try and write jokes about those things. Heck yeah! Even though like nine out of ten of them didn't make it, I still had to give them the options. Yeah. You know, did not. they give you copies, or did you have to track down like ten different foreign? I, I language... had to go track it all down. Oh my gosh. Bless your heart uh, and your commitment. That's awesome. I was committed to <laughs> writing very funny lines for John Barrowman and work. Like I loved Comic Con HQ when I was working over there. That's how I got the job. But all that being said, uh, I got to the Eisners. I was like, oh my god, this I'm so like nervous because it's like all the creators and publishers and everything yeah yeah yeah. i've never been and i was like and plus there's gonna be so many comic book fans and i want to get this right and then i walked in and all the comic book creators are all like bitter towards the industry and just like grumbling amongst themselves and there's like 30 fans and i was like oh this is the opposite of what i was expecting but that's the thing is it's like since there's like 30 other people and like all of the creators are just like eating dinner and getting drunk uh-huh. like you can just walk up to them just walk and up talk and talk to them so and they're not so yeah. Yeah. it's amazing yeah. and, and if you have a positive attitude like you are basically like one of those fish in the deep sea with a light they'll be like oh god somebody somebody happy to see yeah. us thank you yeah You'll meet and everybody. it could have been as many as seventy people. I want to hear you. I want to hear your John Barrowman like like cute quips on Sky Doll at this point, but that's a whole other story. We'll get into Sky Doll later. <laughs> Wait, did he? Does he have? I know. It's on? just I was thinking. He's just imagining Eisner, things he Eisner wants Eisner to see. Eisner Award winner that I want to see Barrowman make shot. I think there was there was the question. Right, no, we may have wanted off the, uh, the question yeah. of which may have may have may have yeah. which uh, which title which image comic got you first? Well, and I'll say. In, in the interest of this show, I reread Youngblood number one and Spawn number one. Okay. Which I Youngblood did. number one was the very first Image comic, and it was their big test balloon to see whether this thing was gonna work. It was created by Rob Liefeld. Did he write it himself, or did somebody else? Oh, write it? he wrote it. He okay. wrote and he wrote and drew it. Yeah. And, and um, uh, how was it? Well, <laughs> well, that's okay. Actually, it was. It's. It's. Uh, I think it's important to always remember that that uh, there's a difference between something like there's art, there's. Art that fails and art you don't like, but it's still art. And I will never, I will never give anyone. This, I, I have a thing of like any dude who who publishes a comic book, writes and draws and publishes a comic book, but basically by himself. I'm never gonna give that yep. much crap to, no matter Do what I think thing. about it. Well done, you 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 made a little mutant baby. I haven't done that. Well done. Uh, and it's definitely and it's and it's definitely art. It goes out to accomplish. It tries to do something and it accomplishes it. It's it's interesting. Reading this book, the, the theory of the book, Young Blood, was it's a superhero, super cool uh, team of spandex-clad, extremely athletic celebrity. They're like they're like super public. It's kind of like a take on the modern Avengers, where everybody knows who Young Blood is, and they get followed around by E Entertainment, and they're dating supermodels and saving the world, and and they're like I think in the first issue they just kill Osama. But not who was the old one, Saddam Hussein. Yeah, I know. They like they just <laughs> topical, like, like topical 1991. Oh my gosh. And like but like it's and like the first two pages 
is like another is another older super team. There's like a prelude. There's like a little like like prologue weird thing, and it's and I'm reading it. And I'm like he's trying to fake Kirby speak. Ah. And like the first two pages are like he's like Jack Kirby, who was like this big comic, but one of my favorites. And it's like it's watching a 14 year old kid. Like if you if you imagine this being a 15 year old kid, the whole thing's fine. And it's a 15 year old kid trying to fake his favorite writer's prose style. And then Kirby shows up as a superhero in the book. Oh my god! There is a there is a Kirby character, and like the villain is obviously I don't even know if he planned it. It's obviously a metaphor for Image Comics. It's him setting up like, hey guys, I know you got defeated by this big villain, but we're gonna come in and save the day. Like it's very much his like, don't worry, Jack Kirby, we're coming to save the industry. Like there's oh, a that's like, adorable. Yeah, so, but it's I don't yeah, it's not even intentional, but it's there, and it's like it's like oh, your attempt to write Kirby s dialogue is really I can tell he's doing it well enough that I can tell he's trying. Yeah, which is impressive. I'm not going like what I'm going. <laughs> can I sort of Kirby? segue from yeah. that to spoil the like the wonderful turn to the story for me, which is the last ten years and the single favorite thing that I learned from this documentary, which we are ruining. Uh, yeah, right now. no, I know. Uh, I hope everyone's going to go see it. By the way, my single favorite thing in this documentary is that I was aware previously, not being super familiar with like the workings of every company, um, but I knew that like at a certain point, the things we associated with Image, like I've been working at the shop since two thousand eight, and like. Things just changed over time. There were books that you didn't really expect to see from Image, uh, most early and prominent of which, like, was Walking Dead, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll, we'll kind of get oh, to. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and, and Chew, and some of these other really outside-the-box oh, things. And eventually I was sort of like, who's running that place? And it's a guy named Eric Stevenson. And Eric Stevenson has been the publisher of Image since 2008. Uh, taking over, I think, for Valentino, who'd mm -hmm. been there for a couple of years, so it they give like some 03. credit. Yeah. So, so some of this credit may go to him. I'm not sure the timing of everything. But my favorite moment in the entire documentary, uh, and sorry, this is so inside, no. but I loved it so much, was the, uh, the story of how Image got Eric Stevenson. Which was that apparently, like a young Eric Stevenson, uh, now now editor extraordinaire, uh, with the amazing taste, like on all these $1 books, he's greenlit, uh, her, read interviews for Youngblood, got really excited, and then read it and was disappointed. And he, yes. uh, this was now my I know, favorite. Now I know what's was, who was he talking yeah. to? Is it was it Jim Lee? I think he said like he was yeah, out of signing, and he sort of Jim said Lee. like, yeah. "Oh, I was kind of disappointed in Youngblood," and he sort of explained the problems he'd had and what the reasons. And Jim went, "Go tell Rob that." And oh apparently, Eric went told Rob oh. Liefeld all the things that were wrong with Youngblood number one, and Liefeld said, "You're hired." Yeah. And he spent the rest of the 90s as an editor under Rob Liefeld's imprint for Image. Um, and somehow, Which was like, extreme, I believe, extreme. right? Extreme. Yeah. extreme uh, wow, and things were very different then. Fast yeah. forward, fast forward. That's how they hired everyone. That, wow. No, literally, that's how, that's how extreme hired everybody. You can watch Matt Hawkins came on the poll and gave us a wonderful interview about the history of Image and all of this stuff. And he told us his own story of getting hired where he basically showed up a shine, a signing and went, huh, these guys are rock stars. I don't really know what's going on. You guys need anything? I hate working at a bank. And he got hired. Man, that's how I the ended up here. Out. <laughs> that's literally how you got here. hired here. <laughs> don't, don't, oh no. Yeah. Hey, I just know people here. I'm just hanging out. Yep. Do Do I want What's, a job? <laughs> well, yes. See, it's the uh, it's the uh, uh, the Be in the right place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's so the yeah, Eddie Izzard, you creepy girl. We need you for our, our, yes, our podcast. Yes, the creepy girl. The yeah. creepy girl. That's me. <laughs> the creepy spider eater. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. I'd hire you. Yeah. yeah. So sorry, that was that was my favorite story. <laughs> no, well, they because had... it was just like the, the 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 image that I've grown so tremendously fond of, like born out of the image that I sort of failed to appreciate at the time. Well, yeah. it was it was boy, was it not for you? Yeah. <laughs> like, and they they came from you know they were coming from Marvel at that time in the nineties and. Well, and the, like they and like it's and it's and it's in it's in Young Blood. Like I'm reading it, and it's and it's his main character is this young guy who's dating a supermodel. And does she have a name, or does it matter? I don't remember. Okay. Uh, barely, and like, he, even even she's like, does it matter? Like, it's it's and it's, but it's like, it's not even. It's entirely a fifteen year old boy's idea of success. Like, it is with none of the it's like. It's not a. It's not a look into what does celebrity do to, to superheroes. It's hey. I'm a superhero and a celebrity. Isn't that awesome? Like that's the whole right. book. Yeah. Is it's not about like there's no, it's like I have money and fame. Cool. And that's pretty. That's much, the book. That pretty much describes right. Describes well, Rob Liefeld. Well, that was exactly what he was yeah. doing at the time. Was like I'm 24 and I, I own suddenly a massive viper and like 
I can I, I, I have, have money coming out of my cars ears. and I have employees that I pay. Hot girls Because we kind of skipped this part. It worked. They it found worked. an yeah. image on this tremendous gamble, and it was wildly successful. And the the crazy thing, I, I loved this, where they like they meet they agreed early on because there were seven partners in the company that Image would never own the books. They would not own the characters. They would not make the movie deals. Uh, and what's so funny is I'm like that's the sort of the great creative revolution they really accomplished. And when you watch the documentary, you feel like, oh, it was just so you guys wouldn't fight each other to the death over yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. But well done anyway. No, but it was it was like, that, that day was one. so significant. Like that day one laid the groundwork for everything that came so later. So let me let me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, We're I so just, deep in. Sorry. I have the biggest question. How, so. What is Image's role? Like, if Extreme owns it and Extreme is producing it, like, what is Image like? like Branding and publishing. Okay, They're the so publisher. That's, so yeah, I, I'm just trying. Like, I, I kept wondering that the whole time. I was like, I wish someone would explain the corporate strategy it's behind this. It's different book like, to book. Not every book is made by a large studio. Some are are smaller sort of outfits. But Image basically has like a skeleton crew, and they are the publishers of your book. So especially these books that don't fall under one of their sort of studio or imprint lines, because they. And I don't know what the deals are like at like Skybound, which is Robert Kirkman's imprint. Sure. I don't oh, know exactly. Skybound is a, is another uh, very creator driven uh, publisher studio because they also do video games now. Yeah. yeah. They, and like uh, and TV games, yeah. and tabletop they absolutely games. Absolutely. Pride themselves yeah, they, on like creators coming first and mm -hmm. having rights. I just don't know the exact details of the deal because I know like in a lot of cases, if you pitch an image book, they they in the documentary they talk about gambling on themselves. Uh, you really are, I, I've known some folks who've done smaller image books, uh, and in some cases, like, you pay up front to get it, like, you pay your artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you sort of bring them your book, and they, like, they print it, and they put it in the magazines, and they send it out, and they do a little bit of marketing, uh, and they take a small cut uh, for, like, per issue sold or something mm, like sure. that, I think is the standard deal. Uh, the idea being, like, they don't, take a progressive thing, they just take their little chunk, like no matter how many millions of Walking Deads you sell, their share doesn't increase because they're just taking their cut as publisher. Um, and that's the standard uh, deal, I believe. Like, so they, right? it, it sounds like similar to how like um, smaller studios, like small, like Legendary has like a first look deal with Warner Brothers. So like they are the ones who retain the rights to whatever films they create, but Warner Brothers is the distributor. So it's kind of Similar to that, I think you probably some versions. There's some variations. A uh, simpler, and just and just in case we like just had a whole take chunk a of the chat analogy. And go, Whoa. Yeah, sorry uh, guys. Yeah, one of the things, Image is an umbrella, so you're gonna hear us say Extreme Studios, McFarland Studios, uh, Top Cow Studios, Skybound, Skybound Studios. Mm -hmm. If you are a creator under Image, you kind of get your own little micro company that's like a little satellite that oh, you, you can, can then like or like as as like uh, Jim Lee did. He had Wildstorm. And once Wildstorm, he was like, at one point, was like, I'm going to take Wildstorm out of Image and just took his little kingdom mm -hmm. and, and floated away like an island. Mm -hmm. And uh, then sold it to DC. Sold it to DC. Right. Which worked out very well on it weird worked, levels. It worked out for uh, Jim Lee, too. It worked out for everybody, but it was, and, and good books, but. So they all kind of, that way there's like no infighting. I don't know, like at some point if anyone ever wants to look up uh, United Artists, it's kind of a similar thing that happened to actors. Right, back in the day when the studio system was getting too much of a stranglehold, uh, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. Her, uh, Douglas Douglas Fairbanks. Fairbanks. And Charlie uh, Chapman, right? Charlie Chaplin? He was, right? he, I think he was I, in on his He right. ended up being part of it, but it was mostly was the, the initiative of, of Mary Pickford, Pickford and Douglas Doug, Fairbanks yeah. were huge stars. Again, at the same time, they, they were pulling in numbers. People, they were America's sweethearts. People loved them, and they were getting taken advantage of by studios, and they were locked into deals they didn't like. Really so they weird started deals. their own company, United Artists, which very much was creator driven. Well, and we should, the we, same should, yeah. Yeah. we should mention there That's that, like, in the golden age of Hollywood, with people would have studio deals. So they would be like, you have a studio deal with Warner Brothers, you're locked into 10 pictures, and until yeah. you've done those 10, 10 pictures, pictures, you can't go and, anywhere else. Yeah, plus and they controlled like how you looked, what you mm -hmm, ate, mm -hmm. who you talked to. You're, who you're, you're marrying dating. your boyfriend, not exactly. this year. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You're in the contract. So like, yeah. that's why UA came around. They were like, all right, well, screw yeah, you no. guys. We're going to go do our own thing yeah. and make, you know. Uh, Which is funny. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. It's, it's very similar. Parallel. And, and, and so these, and, like, these books are very bro -y. They're very bro. We got like if you go back to the old image books, it's a lot of like 
a lot of wish fulfillment because they're not yeah. they're not writers, and you can tell. And it's a lot of it's a lot of. Although some of them then went on to go hire themselves some writers. Yeah, once yeah. they figured uh, out. So, for instance, Spawn got itself a Neil Gaiman. That's a whole uh, episode. Jesus, I forgot. Oh my gosh. Boy, boy, that will be an episode. And Supreme got itself an Alan Moore. More. Oh, wait, uh, really? Yeah, yes. Alan Moore wrote Supreme. This was these guys, these total Bowie guys going on their own. They were the only like ones. Alan, I don't know whether they were the only ones calling him or the only ones he was willing to say yes to. I think, I but think, Alan Moore pulled in some I feel like 90s it was paychecks. The latter. I, I'll say, um, I'll wow. say, I think everyone was watching and going, "We need, the, we need Image Comics not to fold." I right. think I think the creative because community was like because what they quickly like, learned is that being an artist and running a business are very different things. Yes, and, um, it did and not there's come a reason yeah. that you had editors and publishers and marketers and all these other things, which they sort of tried to accumulate around themselves with varying degrees of success. For some people, it went quite well. Like uh, for some people, it was more of a struggle. Uh, and and what's interesting, I'm, I'm going to link it back to modern day image, is that a current trend is like a. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, but I know it's hard. Uh, I'm, I'm Our writers good. are independent creators are starting to hire themselves editors now mm -hmm. because they've realized the value of a having another set of eyes and b having someone who helps you organize the book and put everything mm -hmm. together uh, and and not taking that all on yourself and I think that's a really cool interesting trend. Uh, JP yeah. Boondog asked uh, who was filling in like once Marvel there's this big void at Marvel who filled who who did anybody oh, step man. up? It's a and, good question. I don't know. Well, here's here's the weird answer and this is a weird answer is you're an artist or a writer, and suddenly there's a bunch of vacancies at Marvel, um, and some of them would pop in really quickly. These guys would come in, and, and, and Marvel mostly, Marvel and DC's answer to image was mostly we need to be, have bigger events because while we may not have the talent, we have Superman and Spider-Man, and so we can kill Superman, and we can... We can uh, break Batman's back. Break Batman's back and do all this. Pull Wolverine's adamantium out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I heard that happened already. Oh uh, no, that no, was that the, was. But that didn't happen until like 95, 96. That was a little later. That was okay. attractions, but, but still, uh, same same concept. Yeah. But like you you do three months at Marvel, you show any talent, and Image goes, "Hey, what you doing?" <laughs> and so like, why would you like unless unless you were like okay with the notion of being of being like, why would you work there? Why would it, anyone It really work did there? embolden the rest of the industry. Very, like, they suddenly, Marvel had to start creating more attractive contracts. And they both had to, like, they were forced they to. They forced, the, yeah, Image forced their hand. Image forced them to, like, 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 actually have conversations about compensating people for the, for the characters they create. Yeah. And there are I, now starting to be royalty structures in place. There yes. are now starting to be. Like things that, that you did not see before, where you hear about if you created a character for something and it gets used in a TV show or a movie, you get something. If your tra trade paperback stays in print and it sells above a certain amount of money, you get something. If you, if the you, details yeah. on these deals, obviously, we don't know. If you, if you create a character now, if you create a character at Marvel or DC and that character gets used in another book by another creator, you get a, you get a, I think it's just Marvel, I don't know if they really? both have this. You get, they, you get a little, you get a little kickback. I did that, not know that. That's so their like desperate attempt Wilson to be like, please give us a good, I, a good idea. So like G. Willow Wilson from his Marvel. I think, I, I, I don't want to say I know the specifics, but, but yeah. But like, presumably by what you're saying, like she would be getting a kick, every a kickback time. of some sort every time they're like, hey, she's in the Champions, now yep. she's in the Avengers. Oh, well done, you made us a character that's making money, so you in turn, you, we want to well, reward you mm -hmm. for giving us a good idea. And, and not just you, because you do like it gets tremendously complicated because of course yeah. many many hands are involved in all of these different things. Many characters are involved. Many creators are involved. Like most characters have at least two creators: the writer and the artist. And, uh, but you you it was it's they're they're trying they're working on that problem that's been around like as early as the 1970s. You had creators saying like I think Roy Thomas and some of the others sort of saying like why would we give our best stuff. Yeah, I was, I was actually just thinking Which, like of Roy Thomas because like one of his big things uh, when they pulled him in to be a writer and then later an editor uh, at Marvel, he was one of the first writers hired outside of Stan Lee, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. His big thing was, why would I create a character for you guys to own? I'm going to do that on my own and, and give me my best stuff. In the meantime, you need a new character, so um, I'll make the vision, but he's actually based on Jim Hammond. He's basically the same thing, <laughs> you know, so like... Uh, you know, Jim it turned Hammond, out awesome. Well, so thanks for it, Thomas. Human Torch, but you know, like he did that all over the place. Like every single character he created, like Patsy Walker, was like based on a romance comic, and he's like, nah, cool, Patricia Walker. Now she's Hellcat. Cool, yeah. <laughs> 
You know, um, like I want Millie the model back, man. Yeah. I want Millie the model back. Uh, not we kidding. could do a whole episode on Patsy Walker Hellcat. Man, I should I'm down. see if I can get Kate. Kate get Kate. That would be yeah. so much fun. Uh, but that's why the '90s. That's why the like the late '80s, early '90s. It's Green Goblin, Doc Ock. Mm -hmm. It's that's why we have Rogues Gallery. It's because you're sitting there going, "There's 15 villains established for Spider-Man. Why would I add a 16th? That I'm uh, why you're not going to get any money. For. Why I'm not going to get paid anymore if I create a new character. So like, oh, the book will sell fine if I put the Green Goblin back in there. Yeah, another Green people Goblin. just want to see Spider-Man fighting someone. Yeah. What's interesting yeah. is that you can't stop creative people from being creative. So they are adding new pieces to the mythos and sure. new creatives all the time. And and I I don't know if this is the appropriate time to get into this sort of weird state of 2017, where essentially <laughs> the majors are kind of a farm system for indie comics. They are almost like, and this they get into it a little bit in the documentary where Robert Kirkman talks about it, but it is now not the only model, but one of the major models for getting into comics in the last 10 years is to essentially self-publish something incredibly indie that lets people know you can make comics, which is a lot of work and very difficult to do. It's tough to get people's attention, like, and some people only ever do that, and bless them, they do amazing work. But a lot of those folks want to go to work, I mean... Uh oh. Oh, we're. I think we're in oh. crossover land. Did we just we, get crossover? We get cross no, 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 not yet. <laughs> Never mind. Down, just so you know. Take this yeah. one uh, second. Oh, yeah, go okay. ahead, finish, finish. Uh, so, a lot of people, they, they, there's a track that's been established now where, like, you do some indie work, and then if you are so inclined and you want to work for some of these companies with these legendary characters that we've all grown up loving and with a lot of top notch talent, you go and you work for Marvel and DC um, for a couple of years. Right. And some people will then, like, once you've got a name for yourself and people associate you with a quality or a style of work, you then theoretically have an option to take that awareness and that sort of market presence and do your own stuff again. And some people never come back. Brew Baker, who mm -hmm. did some of the most significant superhero Captain comics America. of this century America. so far, oh. has basically said, I'm done. I did my time. I, no, I spent some years. Like, and, you know, probably along the way, he probably got a lot better at what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He owned his shop. He worked with amazing characters and amazing people. And now he can do whatever he wants. And he used to do that through a creator-owned arm of Marvel. But eventually, once he left the company, he does it at Image. I, yeah. I actually just did a panel at uh, Long Beach Comic Con with a bunch of IDW artists and writer. Um, who uh, talked about the difference between doing your own work and working for a uh, fran for working on a franchise? So somebody, people, artists on Transformers or My oh, Little yeah. Pony, and uh, they all said that, like, at least at IDW, which isn't one of the big two, but still it's, works it's with. Top five. They've got Doctor Who. Exactly. <laughs> they, they don't. Titan does. Oh, Titan has uh, Doctor yeah. Who now. Well, Did IDW used to do it? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay, so, I'm not crazy. But they have a lot of properties, and uh, so they, they said that they are very conducive to, like, influences from, from them, to, to letting them do their own creative thing, their own, take, bring in their own styles. Um, and and that it's very a lot more friendly these days. I, I to, love to, that. at least on the idea side. A lot of people are doing both, and that's actually like my I'm heavily biased, but that is my very favorite model is the people who are doing both, the Kieran Gillens, who mm. are both doing amazing work at Marvel, and doing their like passion projects on the side. I, I, it's difficult, but like I, I think it. in the best case scenario, they feed each other, and then the 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 larger companies will take inspiration, they'll find really interesting voices and get to have them leave their stamp on the universe, and then those people theoretically will have a choice about where they want to put their time and energy. You, you said Kieran Gillen, and I heard Karen Gillian. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I knew, I knew. Yeah. Okay, we'll what? get her writing for Marvel eventually. Right. We'll yeah. figure it out. Uh, I, I actually didn't uh, answer. I think there was the question about what brought what title brought you over to Image. Image. Yes. Uh, and I, I thought it was Saga. Because that's, I think that was the first, uh, you know, of the mar modern uh, uh, image books that I was started reading. But then I realized that Bone was published. Technically, through... Bone was published. Yeah, yeah. Was it? It was cartoon Not at books. First. Okay. Uh, but then issues like starting, and then I looked it up, and issues starting at around issue twenty one, I think, um, they started getting published by Image, which is. Fantastic! Wow. Yeah, yeah, Bone was yeah. an image. That's amazing. Uh, I didn't even realize they're great they're published right, by Scholastic so, now. Yes, so Jeff Smith, uh, writer and artist, it's like 
Lord of the Rings meets Pogo, honestly. Yes! <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, so it's like delightful woodland critters, uh, but then also there's this epic dark storyline in this fantasy world. Uh, I, I adore good it. Good for kids. And yeah, oh, it's yeah. so good, good for, for kids. kids. Um, but good for everybody. Yeah, yeah, but really great. And they've had some, uh, I mean, some great, great uh, crossover uh, artists and writers do it, like like uh, Stan Sakai of Asagi and Jimbo did an issue about the little rat creatures. I think Neil Gaiman might have done one that at some seemed point. Like he had. I don't uh, think I've read that. That's yeah. Amazing. So so it was that, and it, it's again, it's like really quirky, offbeat stuff that that you wouldn't find in any of the big two. Um, and now these days, and I'm saying like I, I read almost exclusively Image. I'm reading uh, Saga, Rat Queens, uh, Sex Criminals, Wicked and Divine. Ada and Alex, uh, and oh, I think so Bitch many. Planet, planet. Uh, and, and I'm in all in various stages of non-completion in all of it's, them. But it's such a glorious time. It's, for them. it's the new. I, I read Vertigo. It's the new, right. It's the new I, I read that, and that was be yeah. just just before all of that. During that during that time period, uh, before I got into Image and Saga, I was reading Vertigo. So yeah. uh, Swamp Thing and uh, Sandman and any Alan weird Alan Moore stuff. Hellblazer. Uh, a Maybe. little bit. Little a little bit. bit. Hellblazer. Yeah, Why yeah, the last yeah. man? Why the last man? Mm -hmm. Why the last man? Yeah. Pizza? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an interesting so thing because it, it's. I, in some ways, I've had mixed feelings about it because, like, I love like Vertigo and everything they've accomplished and over time. Like, and it's interesting to watch from an interesting perspective. Like, Why the Last Man was a Vertigo book. Ex Machina was a Wildstorm book. These are two uh, hits that helped Brian K. Vaughan, mm -hmm. who had been working mm -hmm. at the big companies, make his reputation uh, with his like own properties. Brian he did it at those two, which were like attached to the majors. Uh, and then Saga and Paper Girls are image. But like, I, I, I feel like I feel like I feel like at the core, and this is gonna this breaks my heart to say, I feel like image I feel like image is a better idea than Vertigo. Like, why is that? Well, and I'll just, I'll use this to cap the Golden Days. I, I don't even I don't want to call. It, I'll I'll, I'll, right. I'll use it to cap the Mountain the, Dew days, the, the Golden Mountain <laughs> Dew days, uh, the pioneering days. It was very. They were comic books for Mountain Dew drinkers. Um, yeah. yeah, I like Mountain Dew more. But yeah, but you know what I mean. It was yep. very they they did the do and they did it hard. Um, and wow. if you go back to the old to, to a lot of the old stuff, and like especially the first generation stuff, it's 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 tough to read. But like and even in its like dumb and it's and it's like soft sexism. It's it still is the soft sexism of a fifteen year old who's never actually had a conversation with a girl before. Aww. It's not that they don't like them. It's just that they've never met one. <laughs> You're like, oh, Aww. honey. So it's but 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 like there was a moment they all kind of collapsed. We'll let the documentary go into it. They it kind of all fell apart a little bit. But they had this structure that was necessary. Everyone was was like, we need to keep. There needs to be an island, in the midst of these two big warring companies, where you can always threaten to emigrate to. Yeah. Because it's the only way we're ever going to treat people correctly. Mm -hmm. Is we mm -hmm. we need image, image image made that little safe island where you're like if I don't like what you're giving me. I'm gonna go over to Image and do my own thing, and so you got to make it worth my while, and it's helped a lot, and I think everyone would agree. And there was a book called The Red Star, mm -hmm. uh, and a book. There was another book called Violent Messiahs, which Joshua Desart wrote at the time, which which was it was a very Spanish, uh, and The Red Star, which is a fun read. That was I remember I was I went out with a dinner with Desart and Tone Rodriguez, who were uh, Rodriguez is this amazing artist. And Josh is this great writer and who wrote Swamp Thing for a while. And a bunch of like the new image guys, as they explained, we're doing something crazy. Like I remember going to this, to this, having this dinner uh, right when Red Star had just come out and being like, you mean I'm going to be reading image books again? <laughs> what? How, when, when, when was this dinner? Oh, God. Whenever Red Star came out, I don't know when that is. But it was like in the not, late early, 90s. Oh, late 90s. Okay. I want to say. like, And that was the beginning of Image being a place where you brought your idea. And oh, was it Snakebite was the name of the guy who wrote Red Star? He was an interesting cat. Or may have drawn it. Um, but they, that was the notion was you, we, you can bring your book to us and we'll, we'll give you a platform to be a competitor. Where it's not just... Like the same way in the 90s where like Kevin Smith was making movies, uh, they're the independent film, Miramax mm -hmm. Films. Like suddenly so we actually, have, yeah, this and this is, is where we, we roll in. Because like Image in some ways was sort of like a independent film, whereas Vertigo basically was Miramax. Mm -hmm. Like if you want someone who's gonna help you make your thing better and put resources behind it, 
like and and a lot of like Vertigo and now IDW mm -hmm. and Oni uh, and a bunch of and Boom and a bunch of these smaller companies like they they do contribute something tremendously valuable to the process, which is like they can put resources behind design. You don't have to arrange every single element yourself, like a person making their independent film, like who's just wearing twenty five different hats. Mm -hmm. That can be super overwhelming. Uh, and and they also like I I will go to bat forever for the good taste of editors. Like when you have the right editor, they can they can find you the perfect artist you wouldn't have considered for an idea that you have. They can put together like the partnerships put together by like the, the Vertigo editors especially mm -hmm. have gone on to be legendary. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was actually maybe Shelley Bond who first put Brubaker with Phillips, um, and they Sean, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips are now like an absolute dynamite team that has been working together steadily for years doing incredible comics but it took sort of someone with vision and good taste to kind of make that happen so i kind of i go to bat for both models i, I like we desperately need image to exist as this place where people can have control over their work and be the sell their own dang movie rights uh make their <laughs> own decisions about publishing uh it, it's it's absolutely fantastic but some of these other models like Oh yeah. So, they have so, much so to offer. again, admitting ignorance, uh, you're so. There's what you're. If I'm understanding you correctly, Image does not have much editorial influence over the final product. I think I, almost zero, other than picking yeah. your book other to be published. Other than yay or nay. Like wow. Yeah. That's. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, like, yeah. You can see it's how kind of that's both of. great yeah. and the terrible at the same time. But that is also like, how much faith as a creator, like. Like, I have a hard enough time letting someone read 20 pages of my first a lot, act. A lot like, of the creators will hire their own editorial. Yeah, and I, I remember you saying that earlier, so that's why I was like starting to put it together. And, like, oh yeah. or, and, I, and I think one of the things that Image does, and I don't know quite as much of how they work now, is, is that they offer resources where they're like, like, if you need things, we can provide. You just, we'll hook you up with the right people. But you, we have to know that you're gonna deli like one of their big things is you can't be late. Like oh, you, they're you late all the time. Yeah. Well, that's not I working. Know. Yeah. They yell at, they uh, so yell here's the problem with being independent right. and not having a boss. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's it's and it's so amazing to watch because it's just like when when there's no boss, there's no restrictions on you, but there's also nobody saying like you, you, have, you have to, to finish get, it. Yeah. That's, is that so, what happened? With and you know those creative types. Well, we do. We like it's, it's <laughs> so hard. Like deadlines are hard. Is that is that what happened to like Jupiter's Legacy and stuff like that? Like because like I, I don't know what happened to Jupiter. Because like Legacy. I remember like what, I was what is, so, what is that's it? still going. Is, no, I know it is. But it's a, there was, it's, a yeah, it's it's Mark Miller and uh, Frank Quietly, and I was super excited about it. And I picked up the first couple issues, and then for a couple months I was going back to my store, and it was never. That, like they weren't happened. releasing like the fourth issue. I can't remember exactly the number where it stopped, but it was just like all of a sudden it was like, yeah, we, it's not in yet, and we just haven't Quietly's got it in not yet. the fastest. fastest. <laughs> Quietly is but, not but, the fastest. But Mark, Mark Millar also has a history of sort of like he's he's an incredible businessman, and he sort of I think probably is doing the math on the fact that like he's got a devoted enough fan base in a world that like he can his books can weather lateness that would crush other books a lot of the times, which yeah. is very interesting. But again, he's another guy. He used to, like, he did tons of work at the big companies. He obviously wrote Wolverine, Old Man Logan, and many, many other things at the um, big companies. Old Man uh, Logan. And then went to Marvel's creator-owned, because they tried to compete by by creating Icon, mm -hmm. which was oh, their sort of, this is where you I put your creator-owned oh, yeah. So Icon is their vertigo. Yeah. What was the thought? Well, yeah, but it was sort of with less, it, right. it was less sort of like, there's one, there was no sort of, as far as I know, there was no like Karen Berger whose vision that was, but it was sort of like, if you work at Marvel and you have an idea that you wish you could pitch to Vertigo, we'd love to publish it for you, but it'll have the icon banner. I so see. it didn't proceed for sort of the vision of an executive like Karen Berger, uh, or an executive editor like Karen Berger, who's, who's sort of doing those magic spark editorial interventions, but it was a place for people to put those projects. But again, Mark Miller stopped working with the big companies and he publishes an image now. <laughs> like, you you may be noticing a pattern. Uh -huh. Im and image image now image today and let's like let's start shifting to. Oh, and I let's... forgot Dark Horse when I was talking about amazing. I know. Dark that, Horse that exert like that, that contribute tremendous value in terms of taste and editorial guidance. Right. Like, well, that's get... where oh. Usagi Ojimbo is right now. They're after tons... like he, he did he self publish at first or was he, he did, with uh, one of it was small with uh, Mirage and Fantagraphics. Okay. And then so many publishers. In the eighties, there was a yeah. flowering of independent yeah. publishers. Yeah, and then uh, on to um, uh, uh, Dark Horse. Dark Horse also works with a lot of uh, 
owned properties like Predator, uh, I want to uh, yeah, say. Uh, yeah. They, they picked up a lot yeah. of uh, great a lot video of game licenses. Video in the last game, like, Naughty years. Dog stuff mm -hmm. is all through uh, Dark Horse. And of course, for 25 years, they did the Star Wars comics, as many of you will know. Uh, uh, know weirdly, know. also, uh, Blade the Immortal, they have like one of the few American publishers that does a Japanese manga, which I thought was interesting. Well, the and they, they, they were, they've been huge in manga. They, they chart mm -hmm. as like a manga mm -hmm. publisher, and it was oh, yes, partly absolutely. because the, the sort of early. They are also. They just turned 25. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. We're all getting old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're <We'll be> old. <laughs> Uh, also, anyway, the, yeah, it's it's a beautiful and, and various landscape. <laughs> Sorry. I know it's okay. There's this is one of those things where we have a hundred episodes of this show already lined up because we're going to go mad. Yeah. Uh, Firewolf also says he knows very little about comics, but loves. He's watching the show. He's compounding his knowledge by tenfold. And, uh, he wants to know how our day is going. How's your day? Oh, oh my god! Well, I get to talk about comics with my friends. It's really great. Uh, really quickly too. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask uh, if you Thanks, all Ronnie. could recommend one image title. To read like like a top one because we mentioned a bunch of them, but that's pretty overwhelming. Yes. So for somebody who's just like I, these this sounds interesting. Where where should I start? Well, right, before uh, you answer that, also answer how your day is going. My day is awesome. Although man, I'm going to be working till midnight tonight. I have not slept in weeks. Oh no! It's so good though because we're making great stuff because we love it here. We're actually gonna we're about to be pulled into the to the Nerdist in a minute. So I'm going to I'm going to say that it's time to to sort of. Uh, I'm going to say it's time to sort of wrap this up. We're going to, the Nerdist, we're going to do our little talk with Nerdist, and we're going to come back and talk about modern, our, our, our recommendations for yeah, Nerdist books. Yeah, sure. Because I'm not picking one. So I'm going to kill, I have a special surprise, and it's also just because of your birthday and otherwise, that we're going to say goodbye to the 90s in the most 90s way I know how, with a giant pile of pogs. <laughs> Oh Everybody god. gets a slammer. Oh my god! Wow. The Everybody Marvel gets a slammer. Oh, oh my, my god! god. Oh, this pogs, whole, motherfuckers. Well, this is a whole wow. stack of of uh, wow. pogs of Marvel pogs. Oh my god! Look at I got Spider Man and Silver Surfer, oh. Green <laughs> Goblin and Wolverine. They're not even like most of these aren't even just pictures. They're just like the names on them. Oh my god! All right, and in ten seconds we're going to image now that I just ruined Unbelievable. everything. Unbelievable! Oh my god! Oh, What's my slammer? It just says Marvel Heroes on it. Oh my god! Oh. Go go Pogs! Bad You'll enjoy name. yourself. Oh yeah. Shout oh, out before, and we're, yep. that was happening. we're talking about it. We're really bad at these. Hi, guys! Hey! Look at it. Oh, hi, hi, everybody. Hi, I'm on, and I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, I'm not hearing us. Wait, am I? Hold on, I'm gonna give it a little more Hold on. I might just need to be turned up. Stacey, you guys can watch our show while we play. Hey, guys. I hear you now. Friends of the building, oh, wait, we never get to talk to them. I know, it's, it's so sad. That's true. Oh. <laughs> We're good. Hi, guys. Hi. No, All right, hi. so while we get set up, let me do the intro really fast. <laughs> Joining us today are the guys over at Geek and Sundry's comic book show, Wednesday Club, <laughs> whose show is going live right now. So, like, you're next door to us. <laughs> we could oh, just walk over. the other side of the kitchen. Yeah, I was you're like, on the other side of the kitchen here. <laughs> uh, how's it going? It's great. We've got pogs! We're having a very 90s episode. We've been talking about pogs? 25 years of Image Comics, and Talison celebrated by surprising us with pogs. Pogs! Oh, that's oh, yeah. great. Wait, I'm be jealous, y'all. I'll bring you there guys any, some. Are there any awesome. Pogs? Yes, walk them across. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, somebody act out what you're saying because I literally can't hear a single word. Yeah. So it's like mime it for me. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so we wanted Pogs. to get your guys' hot takes, those hot takes on some of the matchups for those folks in your audience, so the Geek and Sundry audience who don't know. For the month of March, guys, Nerdist is going to be figuring out who is the greatest villain of all time as decided by the fans. Every day, we're going to be polling our audience on Nerdist.com and filling in the bracket until we have the answer. And today is your last chance to submit your brackets over at Nerdist.com, so make sure that you get your March Badness brackets in today by 11.59. I mean, that's like one minute left. 11.59, <laughs> just make it 12. PST to be entered for your chance to win. So we're going to break down a few early matchups today. So these are some tough ones. All right, guys. Joker versus Pennywise, a.k.a. Stephen King's It. Mm. Oh, no contest. Joker. What? 
Uh, I mean, really? think about who's had more influence on pop culture. Who's won an who's Oscar for the performance? It's a better design well, here's a question. Well, is the Joker like, designed as the Joker because of Stephen King's clown being scary in the first place? Yes. Yes, oh, yes oh, that, oh, that, that, that is it. That's the right answer. Yeah. The, jo the yeah. Joker is older than yeah. yeah. The Joker was designed Joker off of the silent it. film. Scary clowns yeah. may come from Joker, Joker who comes yeah. from Mary yeah. Last. Which is a great silent film. I feel like scary clowns are just... Scary clowns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Scary clowns have existed since time immemorial, I suppose. Yes. You know, yeah. Because I mean, Pennywise is immortal. Are probably. Yeah. 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 That's true. Pennywise is immortal. He's essentially a demon just yeah. in a clown outfit. Yeah. I mean, he tears off that kid's arm. So there's an argument to be made here that if, if Pennywise is a demon in a clown outfit, and Joker is just a person who is evil, I think Joker's worse. Because uh. the demon is evil by nature. The Joker is maybe choosing evil oh, over anything I, else, which makes him kind of argument. worse. I, I, I've got, I, I'll also say that Pennywise was played by, by Tim Curry, mm -hmm. and the Joker was almost played by Tim Curry before they went, he's not evil enough. We need to go more evil, and they got Mark Hamill. Whose oh. dumb oh. statement was, was that, though? <laughs> Tim Curry was absolutely evil enough. What the they're, fuck? They're, what they, a, had, they replaced Tim Curry as the animated Joker. Nobody yeah. 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 had yeah. 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 They sound dumb. dumb. It did turn yeah. out okay. okay. Yeah, he, yeah, they had to so re the with Mark Hamill's voice yeah. over over Tim Curry's. That's, I can't. But I don't know. That's yeah, a good I gotta point, go. Though, I was gonna. I was ready for Pennywise. I gotta go, Joker. Oh yeah, yeah I, 100 Joker. I, I think I'm saying What's Joker. You it's called the comic, comic book show. Like We're a little biased. Stuff too, like monster. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was. I was like, no. I want to say not huh? the like comic book villain people. for that reason. Uh, you trying to play against type. It's not gonna work. I've, so. had, I've had nightmares right. about Pennywise. So final vote. What do you think? Joker. Joker. We're saying right. Joker. All right. Fine. 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 Alien Queen versus Bowser. Not Bowser at our office, although I could, <laughs> I could make it. Andrew Bowser could be one. Ooh. I mean, it, I mean Alien, Alien Queen. Queen. Yeah, no yeah. question that on that one. That one's slightly Ooh. tougher. Uh, Bowser is not very effective in his malignancy, honestly. Yeah. Like, he just kidnaps Princess Peach every time. But there is yeah. that peculiar, like, don't think it throughness to Bowser's evil, where you're like, okay, what's your plan? All right, so, are we, so are we, are we going to do There Will Be Brawl, Bowser? Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> Do Bowser's not look persistent. that up. Oh my God, uh, there will Google be there will be brawl. So, so I feel like let, me, let me throw this out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a Wait, are, as Bowser. What's that? Hmm? Well, that's but that is that a flaw though? Because Bowser's just too stupid to know when he's been yeah. beaten. No, I think we got to give it up for Bowser. Just keep <laughs> like after 30 years, he still just, he won't give up. I that's I gotta go point. with Alien Queen. I, I feel like Alien Queen too. you know. She's, I mean, I in, in terms in terms of uh, efficacy, I'd say Alien Queen takes it. <laughs> <this. Let me, laughs> Although again, Bowser keeps coming back. That's let me point. let me throw this out out at you as a, as a different way to think of it. Make make the Bowser and Alien Queen both look the same, because if you think of the Alien Queen, like you immediately think like, well, she looks evil. She She's looks very sinister. She's got such an edge in design. She's got yeah. such an edge in design. Yeah. So if you make Ooh. Bowser look like the Alien Queen, she's basically just an evil dolphin on a certain level. That is true. <laughs> or if you make the Alien Queen look like Bowser. Right. Oh. I think, you know what? Alien. But that's the thing. If you take the look out of it, she's more evil. But that's the thing yeah. is, you yeah. have to take design. We are taking design into account. Yeah. So it's like an H.R. Geiger yeah. sort of yeah. sexualized yeah. monstrosity, like or like something admittedly kind of cute Japanese character. You sort of want to call like a job for deviant. Yeah. Even Bowser in the art. But you guys are saying what? Yeah. I'm, I'm saying evil queen. I'd say evil so. queen. Yeah. Alien, right. alien queen. Yeah. Are you guys going with? Uh, although so you're going to stick with Bowser. I'm sticking with Bowser. Uh, uh, audience, send send your fan mash fan mashups to yeah. hashtag yeah. Yeah. Club and Mars <laughs> Madness. Oh. Yes. So, ooh, here's a good here's a good argument. Chris Nath Dragon says Bowser destroyed the universe once. Granted, it was accidental, yeah. but he did but, do yeah. it. <laughs> but the, this is the ongoing and, question. And, and, and quite the track monsters. record. Like I'll also say I'm always more excited for a Mario movie than an alien, alien film. Is doing what her biology tells her to do. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like with all the monsters, you can make that argument then. Yeah, and then that just defaults it. So yeah. mon it is the like That's monsters good, versus yeah. evil people who are choosing to do it versus things that are operating by their very nature. But are they yeah. choosing to do it? Maybe they're just born evil. Mm. Yeah, but there's still a longer conversation. Yeah. <laughs> the choice, even if you're born evil, the choice to be evil is, is you know, there's. there's I mean, some okay. Nuance. So here's the thing: as I, the, in the end, they might have the same goals because for the alien queen, it's perpetuation of the species, right? 
Apparently, the Koopa Kids uh, peaches their mom. Maybe, they mentioned that in what? one of the games. Yeah. That's what they mentioned in one of the games. What? Whoa. 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 Probably oh not. My God. God. Jesus. I know, but I'm not touching that. I'm not <laughs> it's gross, okay. people. It's okay, I just said it. We're, we're, we're just going to move on things. because you just blew my mind. Well, she teaches the band <laughs> and she walked out on her So upset. Oh. oh, God. <laughs> she, what if that was I just like, come back? Holy shit. Right no, guys, listen to Joan. Wait, what listen if... Joan. Wait, what Listen if, to this. Wait. What if Peach is the villain of that story, actually, because she walked out on her kids, I, and Bowser's just like, it. come back, your children need oh. you. <laughs> oh, my God. Peach Holy shit, Joe, that's house perfect. Yeah. Out of that situation. Oh, yeah. Where's the trailer for that like very sad it's dark movie? Oh my god! I want it. I need it. Holy shit! Peach is Gone Girl. Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh my god! Peach is Gone Girl. Holy Someone shit! Someone make that. Oh my god! Somebody, somebody internet? in chat, somebody make this. Make this. Do your job. <laughs> Do your job, internet. Make this for us. He's All right. So Glados versus Agent Smith. Mm. Glass GLaDOS, right, versus wow. Agent, Smith. Agent Smith, yeah. In terms of impact on pulp culture, I'd have to give it to Agent Smith. Uh, In terms of being a better villain, more well-rounded, with uh, better acting, I'd have to give it to well, GLaDOS. There's, there's, there's better more acting? Meat. There's more meat. GLaDOS has oh, yeah. more meat. I don't even know if it's about acting, it's just that like, there's meat to he GLaDOS. He performs the heck out of Agent Smith. I he mean, does, in terms he does of, a lot with what okay. he's a specific kind it's of true. performance In that's terms of being a better, a better, well-rounded, compelling character, Especially after Portal 2, I'd, I'd say GLaDOS. But we're not talking about character talking development. About we're just talking about evil. Who is more so, evil? I would say oh, well. Agent Smith is doing it for himself. Mm -hmm. So he has selfish reasons just for him. And GLaDOS, though, just wants to... Well, I guess she's kind of doing it for herself, too. But she's she's also yeah, out to I destroy she's everybody in the process. I think she's doing yeah. it to watch the world burn, right? That, like she only yeah. has one person in the world. <laughs> she's less effective. She's only torturing one person, whereas Smith is really ruining everybody's good time. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of effective evilness, which is well, more evil though, to like just zero in on someone and and control their life in this terrifying way, or to just be like, I will remake the world. I, well, I, I mean, say, let's just turn to WikiLeaks really quick and just. <laughs> 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 I'm more to see How are you guys feeling I about your lives? Agent <laughs> Smith, then. Agent Smith. Wait, right. So, yeah. Agent Smith has a larger scope of evil, like what we would consider evil. I'd like to point out that GLaDOS like, makes fun of a woman's weight. Uh, yeah, so she's like, a bitch. That's, so that's crappy, though. Dick move, that's, right? that's also yeah. craftsmanship. Dick I've got to say, it's craftsmanship. She does have. Right? She's. She may not be it's making it in bulk, stuff, but but yeah. the evil she makes is well is well formed. Right? <laughs> Psychological <laughs> manipulation. It's artisanal evil. It's artisanal yeah. evil. It's <laughs> artisanal <laughs> evil. Smith is like mass-produced evil. So who, what are we feeling? What do you guys think? Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know I had a. I'm feeling Glados. I'm gonna say Glados too. Guys? Yeah, yeah. GLaDOS. GLaDOS. Yeah, GLaDOS. Yeah. All right, so we got GLaDOS. Uh, so that GLaDOS wins. All right, so we guys, we do have a prize pack for the winner. You must be 18 and a United States resident to enter. However, we here at Nerdist and Legendary cannot actually win the prize. But when B-Comp had me sign for my coffee last week, he also had me sign away the rights to my parking spot for a month. Hashtag not true. Hashtag it's in my contract. Hashtag go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much, Wednesday Club, for joining Thanks. us. Yay. Bye, Bye guys. We'll see you Next later. We'll see you 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 later. We'll what? Wow. That was fun. That was so that was fun. Good. I, I have to say, I'm proud that we chose Joker. Where are you saying? Yeah. I was going to oh, say, and yeah. I'm, I'm happy Joker to be using, uh, we, we had now have better tech than we used on the moon landing, which is very exciting, which was yeah. actually weirdly shot in this studio. Isn't that <laughs> the moon landing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't know if forget that. Yeah. Kubrick signed the wall. It's We're cool. not supposed to mention it. Oh, and that's a big NDA I keep forgetting. <laughs> Uh, welcome back to our uh, image so show. Friggin' Pogs! Pogs. Pogs. Thanks, Talzin! Oh, oh my god. The gauntlet. 
Uh, I did. I love that mine for Invisible Woman is just the logo. Like, thanks, guys. It's No, she's, they drew her. <laughs> she's there. I know, Pictured. yeah. So some Invisible of them, Woman. Some of them, like, my, Wolverine is just, it says Wolverine. My favorite oh, I thought they were being I, clever because she's invisible. When I, when I reached into the pile, I pulled out Rhode Island. East Providence, Providence, Cranston, also, Bristol, Coventry, East Greenwich, West Kingston. Kansas. Kingston. There's also a scene, yeah. the scene oh. from Casper in which Christina Ricci is talking to her class. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What? Rita Repulsa. I have Rita Repulsa. Oh, oh yeah. Oh That's my on. God. Nineties so. pulls. Everybody. We're, we're, we'll probably trade these amongst ourselves later uh, off yes. camera. Yes. Although uh, we may we may tweet or Instagram some photos of these. All right. Oh, Ralph. <laughs> so since we're here. Ralph. How do you and, say uh, name? Uh, Rolf? Rolf? Rolf. 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 Always said Rolf. 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 Yep. yep. Yeah. Pretend I said that. Um, Rolf. Muppets. Uh, we'll probably, we'll, uh, as we as we mention them, we'll try and get the, 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 the our poor tech, tech savvy, tech savvy people are going to try and put things on the screen. What are some, so modern image is a big cacophony of crazy, cool, not well, superhero y. I have still not answered that one question of what image comic. What was your yeah. first Yeah, also, comic? how was your day? Yeah, and how oh, was your day? How was my day? Uh, my day has been uh, great. I got to write some stuff for Screen Junkies, which is always fun in the morning. Nice. Um, and uh, then I came here, so it was good. It was good. I've been at a Starbucks since seven, which is like. Oh. Americano after Americano, type, type, type. Now I get to go talk comics. This is how great my brain is. I was like, you're not at a Starbucks? What <laughs> you oh. oh, I'm caught up. I'm uh, good. And I'm back. Uh, so my day's great, and it's your birthday, and that's fantastic. And I'm here with some of my close friends. All week, today. all week. Yeah. Is okay, all first week. image. Right. Uh, so, like I was saying earlier, like the 90s, like comics, I was just like, meh, I'll stick to my Marvel and try. I'll continue trying to get into DC and just never being grabbed by it. But I'm going to. Every year I'm gonna give it three, four, five, seven books and try. Uh, and Image just never grabbed me um, until Saga. Saga's the yeah. first comic where I, I, went in, I went into Collector's Paradise, my shop in Pasadena. I'm gonna say this was 2012 maybe. This is a comic ish, written yeah. by Brian K. Vaughn yeah. and illustrated by Fiona Staples. Uh, and Super Andy times. Legal, who is now like uh, kind of like one of the high up sales guys over at um, Valiant, was the manager there. And uh, I came in and I was like, hey, uh, I get Marvel and DC every week, but uh, what else should I be getting? He's like, Saga 1 just came out today. You should grab that. Nice. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'll grab that. Sure, that sounds good. Went home and was immediately hooked. And I've been following, like, so, looking at image stuff so ever we, since. So we've, we've yeah. got a Saga character on our on our amazing, on our... On our is that uh, Prince Robot? Prince Robot. That's Prince Robot. Prince Robot, Prince Robot the fourth, fourth. Is hang, hang, yeah. in, hang in with Spawn, uh, like you do. Uh, but give give us an elevator pitch for 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 those at home who have not read who have not Saga. I know yeah unless you want to like pass that pass that down uh, I may have to pass it because I'm about five books behind but well we don't want spoilers just no, give us the premise the, the 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 premise behind it is uh, these two are more or less like Romeo and Juliet characters uh, they're forbidden uh, there's a sort of like racial problem I can't remember their names Marco and uh, Alana 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 thank you uh, but they. They get together, they're two uh, alien species are at war with each other, and then uh, they have a kid. And that was kind of assumed to have never been able to happen or should never happen. It's a bit of a... Or just like, why would you have a why baby? Why would you have a baby? So more like, enemies. That's so weird. They they become immediately anathema to the entire uh, galaxy Good and have word. to go on the run. I went on to seminary. We, we are going to get a <laughs> cover uh, shot. There we go. <laughs> we got that one up for the moment. We're going to yeah. get the other cover Perfect. moment. Um, but they uh, they go on the run and they get hunted down by the sort of like galactic federations that are in charge of everything. And then uh, the guy that we just saw was the Will with Lion Cat, and he's like a bounty hunter. And so, so, so it's a big, wonderful, sophisticated it's world, but it's gigantic also this, this very down to earth sort of slice of lifey story about a young couple falling in love and like navigating being a family for the first time. And one of my favorite, and I maybe I'm gonna get it wrong, and maybe it's like uh, improperly attributed to him because I've never spoken to Brian K. Vaughn. But a quote that I have heard associated with him is that he wanted to create a book that films could not adapt. Where he was like, I want to create something so big and broad and out there and wacky that studios will look at it and say, yes. That's what Alan Watchman's, uh, that's what Alan Moore said about Watchmen, though. Yeah, they yep. never say never. Yeah. But, but I've heard that before, that he was he was trying to get himself out of the mode, because he's worked in both TV and mm -hmm. comics, mm -hmm. where, yeah, like... He lost, he was, he was a writer lost. on Lost. Yep. Um, they... The, the story, though, that I love is that he was writing Why the Last Man. Thank you. Thanks, that was so much fun. Thank you. Um, Anytime. Thumbs-upping thumbs our friend from Nerdist. Uh, 
uh, who walked all the way over here to tell us that that went well. Tens of feet. Um, uh, Frank Yvonne had written a book called Why the Last Man, which was uh-huh. notable both for a lot of things, but two of them were amazing like character developments told through like flashbacks and amazing cliffhangers. Mm-hmm. And the Great sort of urban legend version of the story is that the people who were making Lost at the time went, you know what we <laughs> mostly do is amazing cliffhangers and incredible character development told through flashbacks. Get that guy. Yeah. Um, no kidding. This is he wrote, how he wrote, some, he wrote some good episodes of Lost too. Like some of my favorite episodes of Lost, where where he had, had his fingerprints all over them. Yeah. But he I, both had like had 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 a family and wanted to sort of stretch his brain and his yeah. imagination, and so wanted to create this big crazy story that was also this like sarcastic, so, funny, down to earth family if, drama. If I remember correctly, I, I I became a bit obsessed with Brian K. Vaughn after Saga came out, and I went and read um, a little bit of Deus Machina. Ex Machina. Uh, yeah. Ex Machina. Yeah. Uh, didn't really grab me, but I tried, uh, and I this read... This was a Wildstorm uh, book he had about a superhero getting elected mayor of New York. And I, I, I read all of Why the Last Man. Well, one uh, of my favorite books of all time. It's, mm. it's really good. Uh, but if I remember correctly, like, Marvel actually went to, like, screenwriting schools and, like, story structuring schools in New York and kind of had, like, this farm system where they were like, hey, we're looking for up-and-coming writers, why don't you pitch to us and stuff like that and he was one of the ones who did that and they were like kidding. great come and uh, we'll teach you how to write comics and he be, he immediately fell in love with that yes, so. I did not know yes I, I did not know I, I've, I've read that somewhere I think uh, it was like an interview with him where he was talking about how he first really first got into it I don't know anything about that. I don't know if I'm telling it wrong or if it even nice. exists. In, in the interest of storytelling, I'm always a big fan of hearsay and innuendo, and, and nothing <laughs> that we say is necessarily verbatim. You're welcome to fact check, check us. We will admit to it if your version, if the, if the truer version of the story is more interesting, yes. but if it's less, we're not going to screw We will maintain our truth. Oh. The, myth, the myth is better. But I, I, that being said, I will always admit my ignorance. Like, <laughs> you don't yeah. learn anything sure. otherwise. There's you so know? much to know. There's no. so much to know. Like, it's impossible to know it all. But Saga is, um, it's, if, if, it's the book that got me into Image, and from there I discovered like five ghosts and and uh, uh, just a so many well, bitch like, planet and everything. So. A, a, a question I love asking people when they when they tell me about a book like this, especially for a show like this, is when people are asking me like, "What comic book should I read?" I've never read a comic book before. My first question is always, "What movies or TV shows do you like?" Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is what really is the good. movie or TV show like? Are there a couple movies or TV shows that would that would signal to you so like if you're a fan of blank saga will be like. All I can think is it's kind of Jodorowsky-ish for me, Saga, but like yeah. that doesn't help anybody. Yeah, so uh, doesn't help me at no, all. No, it helps no one. That's the worst thing well, to say. Well, uh, one thing that I like is like if you're into sci-fi, you will really love it. But if you're into sort of intimate relationship-based stories, you will also love it because that's uh, one thing that always daunted me about a lot of superhero comics was uh, the scope. It was mm. far too much for me to read to get into. Um, for this, there's a simple through storyline and despite the fact that you get a taste of world building of all of these these uh solar the solar system that is at war with each with itself over these two different races um it's really just about a family at its heart yeah you, you know what you know here's here's how i would describe this book it is uh star wars fell into david bowie's labyrinth Ooh. Ooh. interesting I see it. I felt that. I felt that. Because it's 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 a fantasy in space. Yeah. It's, it, it's not a space opera. It's uh, got a bit of Guardians of the Galaxy, the movie vibe. Just just because it's like yeah. colorful ish, and but big. But this came out before that. Oh yeah. So like it's not influenced but, by but that. It, no. But like but yeah, something that represents that sort of the way that it can be sarcastic and down to earth at the, within that context. Yeah. Uh, and like I'm I'm saying Star Wars only because it's. In no, space and, and a bit it has of a fantasy, elements of space opera, yeah. But, it, but but it's mostly like it's you take Labyrinth and put it out like make it interstellar and not in terms of story, just in terms of like world building and such and stuff. It's like a great that. piece of world building. Yeah. yeah. You know, like and you could like almost do any fantasy, but like I feel like Labyrinth was very much like its own thing, which is why I chose that, you know, over like But like they who's you know, who, like Harry without Potter being or something. meta or self referential, like who how do we, like? It's a great it's thing. It's like about a Liz Lemon sense of humor in a Star Wars world. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, that's real good. It's just like people oh. dealing with these nonsense situations and just trying to sort of get through them as best they can. Um, mm-hmm. But then with the sort of like 
real elements of drama added on to them as they sort of fight and and deal with new stuff. Like, like I feel I feel and I feel like a lot of the characters that he creates like like Prince, Prince Robot and stuff like that like Prince Robot. Uh, <laughs> like I am not a liter literary critic like I'm not even going to try and pretend to be like well what he means by Prince Robot is uh, he's making a commentary on technology like I'm not going to do anything like that perhaps he is but it feels like he set he just wrote random words down and shook it up <laughs> and TV had uh, Prince. There's a there, there, and then and then he said, "Yeah, why not?" There, and I feel like he did that to every single. There, thing. There's a word for that kind of art form. Do you do you, do you know what that kind of art is called? <laughs> Data. Dadaism. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was actually that would be Dadaism. Then that is what I feel like and he has done. Someday in we will talk form. about the Brotherhood of Dada, <laughs> which is a group of villains in DC Comics, which are some oh, of my. Oh God. Things, <laughs> yes. So, so we've done this entire thing without mentioning the Wicked and the Divine. I think. Uh, I was figuring it was going to get to me. Oh, and okay. I was going to ruin you. But like, but, the, but it's not your your first image one, or is? It, but that's your recommendation. No, your I did, that kind of did my first image one. I was the last one to answer that question yeah. because we are so. But I was using yeah. him as a segue into like good books to pick up now. So uh -huh. she's kind of like covered Saga. Okay. And I was gonna say, Eric, do you have anything? Not even your first, but like, like, what's a good image? Uh, you also yeah. love Saga, so like, feel right? Free so to like Saga was my was was, like. was probably my first one that pulled me into image in a big way in the modern era. Um, I'd say my number one pick for right now is Rat Queens. Yeah. Uh, do you like Dungeons and Dragons? No. <laughs> do you like fantasy? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> These guys. Nah. Oh, yeah, let's uh, let's do flip. you like maybe the snappy? Uh, the, the snappy sort of violent dialogue of Tarantino, then you might like Rat Queens. It is like a, like, you know when, when you tell the story of your epic adventures on your D&D &D campaign uh, and, and the fun times you have at the tavern and the crazy kooky things that your party members get up to, it's like that told with a masterful storytelling lens and all the characters are so colorful and interesting. They just happen to be really cool ladies. Yep. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's Hannah who's, who's kind of like the Betty Page uh, wizard and and then there's uh, there's uh, Violet, who's this um, like surly dwarf character, and there's D, who's uh, a shaman who's uh, like uh, involved with some eldritch horror business, but trying to figure out who she is, and uh, Betty, who's kind of like uh, the <laughs> well, me uh, of the rat queens, I guess. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot more crazy drugs. drugs. Yes, I, was, but... I was about to say, like that's a, that's a, that's, that paints a picture. But, but yeah. that, yeah. But uh, it's and it's 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 so delightful because I, you know, I grew up with loving fantasy and Dungeons and Dragons, and I felt like there wasn't uh, there wasn't enough uh, in fantasy. There wasn't enough inclusion in fantasy for my liking. You know, uh, I feel like after just. Uh, so much time spent in that genre, people started to fall into tropes and get into patterns, and I feel like that is that Rock Queens just smashes all of those conceptions um, and does fantasy in a way that I want to see. So I, I would highly recommend Rock Queens. It's, it's it's very tabletop fantasy. Like very it, feels, it feels fantasy. very tabletop. And uh, you might see a cameo from a certain famous Dungeons and Dragons group. Maybe. Maybe. I'll actually, I'll say if, if if the powers that be are feeling feeling fancy, there's probably a, an image somewhere in the Dropbox right now labeled Rat Queen's Cosplay. Um, that may be a thing. Yeah, sure. I won't get in trouble. Yeah! yeah. yeah. There's, 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 our, there's our critical role crossover. So good. <laughs> that's, that's not the only crossover there's been. No, there's other no. ones. Thanks to, thanks to Ted. There's, there's yeah. Yeah. Do you know anyone who has any D&D adventures? No. Yeah, that's a no. shame. You should get in a game. I think you'd like it. Who has time for games? <laughs> that's uh, uh, We will note Saga and Rat Queens both contain some mature content. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. watch out Very good note. for that. Full <laughs> frontal <Gotcha>. nudity. <laughs> it's great. Dot, dot com. Hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but also a lot of blood and gore and, you know, so. Yeah. And I love frontal like nudity Queens. with yeah. blood and gore. But it's like, it's <laughs> awesome the way, it's not cheesecake. It's something that's it's, allowed into their palette of things to storytell. It with. is. It's not just it like a, it's, it's owned and it, and it makes sense in terms of the storytelling. I mean, uh, Saga starts out with the childbirth, which mm -hmm. is literally. The, I, I kind of wanted to show y'all, but I was like, I don't know if the nah. terms of service cover this. Right, <laughs> uh, it's, and it's it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so I don't, yeah, we though. we don't know what you're doing right now. We'll, yeah. We'll, yeah, we don't know yeah. where you are, what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Rat Queens would be my pick. Saga is also a, a, a fine 
title to pick up that I would highly recommend. Yeah. Do, do you want Wicked and Divine or should I take? No, already, go for it. Well, I'll, I'll say, and also I'll say, uh, uh, Leo Kara says all Gladys uh, cares about is science. To me, the most evil <laughs> thing she did was delete her former self. It symbolizes leaving all her compassion for her humanity. Uh, who are your favorite vi video game villains? That's oh my God, too many. Good. Oh, oh my uh, gosh, Arden is a big one. That, um, that's I, a whole. I would have said to, to me, it's Glados. Glados, hands down. Um, just uh, she's so complex. And and I uh, like Handsome Jack. I'm a Handsome Jack. Handsome Jack. Handsome Jack. Handsome Jack. He's a great, great. villain. Uh, has, uh, and there's another question coming in. We'll get in for a second. I say a lot of puzzle games. I'm gonna, have bad guys. Uh, do we? Have, I know I brought some Wicked and Divine, but if you brought some Wicked and yeah. Divine, uh, I'm going to talk about two quick books. Um, I've already pitched Wicked and Divine on a, on a Signal Boost. Mm -hmm. Wicked and Divine is one of my favorite. Current, it is my probably my favorite image comic book. Um, Every, and I'm probably going to get the number wrong, every 90 years, 70 years, I'm not sure. I think it's 90. 90 years. I think it's 90. Uh, 12 gods descend, 12 different gods from different religions descend into the bodies of young people, and they are, it was their love, they are adored, they are worshipped. In two years, they will all be dead. And it's an exploration of fame with some superpower genre and stuff. Creativity. But it's, and creativity. And it's also like the notion of being a creator and about, about being, and about celebrity and about... And kind of set through the lens of like pop stars as superheroes, and there's avatars for different pop stars. It's too smart to really tie together comfortably, but it's you'll know really quickly if it's for you if you pick up issue one. It's I, I mean, think as, that's also sorry, as yeah. someone who like you know like studied theology and was in seminary and like just like anything that deals with like mythology and fantasy and magic, I immediately jump onto. Like I read the first just like TP. TPD and was trade paper big trade paper big TP all all about it yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do that boom. anyway I, I interrupted you. this this book has my number like very few things out there uh, and what's interesting especially is that like uh, the intro to Wicked and Divine is sort of through the eyes of a fangirl named Laura uh, who's just like attending one of the gigs for one of these gods uh, and sort of comes into like contact with their world. Uh, and and it's uh, this is a, a weird thing I guess to pick on, but like it was interesting to me that that book it starts with her sort of getting dressed up and going out to a club and having this sort of ecstatic experience, and the thing is like that's not really in my like I I don't super relate to like I, I love rat queens, but like I don't really relate to taking mushrooms on a picnic. That's mm -hmm. not inside my experience. Um, but like Wicked and Divine is so much about passion and about fandom and about that kind of ecstatic experience that like it didn't matter that I don't have the same like like the world was so accessible to me without me being remotely able to like relate to like people living pop star lives mm -hmm. uh, and and the the mythology and the characters are so incredible uh, this is again a writer artist team we've now worked together several times mm -hmm. uh, to great effect uh, I would say issue thirteen of the Wicked and the Divine is one of the best single issues I have read in years. Which which uh, which issue it's is Tara? Oh, oh fucking Tara! <laughs> yep. Wow. That that's a reference. That's a reference you uh, will get. And it, yeah, we don't want it. You can't say a damn thing about you that. You can't issue say a thing about it. I can't. It's every it's, every panel is a spoiler. Uh, but this this book is is incredible. Issue twenty seven came out today. Yes, by the it way. did. It's sitting on my iPad, ready to go. <laughs> um, and I own. Tons of art. I have framed copies of the books on my. Uh, I mean, like, I'm really. This is You're into it for me. I'm super, You're super into it. I convinced a friend to cosplay as Lucy. Oh my god! Yeah, probably more. Probably oh more my god! Like, Every god. city was a Jesse Pride more cosplay. <laughs> Uh, I think it was a, a bed of amazing uh, Wicked cosplay. We, when I say Wicked, it means the Wicked and the Divine. We're all very bad and casual internet people yeah. when we say Wicked. Uh, but interestingly, if you if you do get sucked into this world, Kieran Gillen publishes writer notes for every single issue uh, about his research and the things they were trying to do. Really? Mm -hmm. They're on, on, on Tumblr. Oh, oh yeah, huge, oh, that's wonderful awesome. liner notes. Uh, it, it's... it's this this book is is rocking my world. So thanks, Image. Uh, so that's your recommendation. So what is? I guess or was he, that, his was no, that. No, you have two. You have I was also going to say I was also going to say Fell, which is kind of an older book, which oh, is nice. a little weird. It was it was a Warren Ellis experimental thing where he he and I'm trying to remember the name of the artist. I feel so bad because I actually own some of his art now and I'm blanking, but I, my coffee is wearing off. Um, it's a detective in a town called Snowtown. It's just this really gritty, grimy detective story with amazing art, and it's 
it's very clever and very, but it's dark, dark, uh, uh, noirish. Uh, and the snow town is just like this bad part of town. And there's this thing that everyone paints, which is an S and an X. And this came out during Katrina. And people started, fans of the, of the book started tagging their buildings with the snow town logo Whoa. to sort of like, Send graffiti messages to each other that everybody was all right in New I Orleans. I did not know this. There were Snowtown logos all over. It's a great book. I don't want to ruin anything other than saying it's super violent, it's super dark, but really well written. And it's called Fell? Fell. F E L L. Oh, One man. graphic novel, six issues, dark. Uh, we're running out of time, so come yeah, on. Pitch real a book. quick hits. I'm going to quick, uh, quick pitch as many of these as I can. Uh, if you like dystopian sci fi, exploitation films meet Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You want to be reading Language Warning, oh, Bitch Planet. so good. I love uh, it. This is a fantastic book written by Kelly Sudaconic and illustrated by Valentin De Leandro with uh, guests who come in periodically. I would say the back is pretty, is yeah. pretty like gives you a pretty good what? feel. They do fake ads on okay. the back of each issue yeah. that relates to, it, it takes place in a near future world where the hyper oppressive patriarchy has progressed to the point that women who don't behave properly are labeled criminally non-compliant or NC uh, and shipped Shipped off to, to a the, planet, like, well, a prison planet. Uh, yeah, like the Auxiliary Compliance mm -hmm. Institute or something like that, informally known as Bitch Planet. <laughs> uh, and it's it's this wonderfully imaginative sci-fi. It's dark and funny, but you fall deeply in love with these characters, including some who are just sort of trapped in that system. I fell in love with Penny Roll so fast. Is, is that yeah, a name, Penny, Penny Roll? Roll. Oh, Penny Roll God. is a with unique the, and wonderful thing. Oh. A thing I love, there's not a characters. lot of merch for Bitch Planet because they refuse to partner with a company that won't offer sizes up to, like, that taps out at 2x. Um, awesome. Because wow. they're like, we can't be a book starring Penny Roll and, and tap out at 2x. And not make a shirt you could wear. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so there's wow. very limited official merch That's for it, but so they, they've cool. got uh, Espionage nail Cosmetics mm -hmm. has nail wraps. And they just launched a line of I leggings that mm -hmm. miraculously go up to, like, 6x, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and that they they designed new leggings live at Emerald City Comic Con. I it was a great convention. Uh, so yeah, Bitch Planet is amazing. A dark fantasy that's unlike most other things on the shelves and incredibly beautiful. Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda uh, do a book called Monstrous. It's it's really rich world building. Uh, with a, a heroine who's been through some stuff. Uh, you've heard us talk about this before, but we would be remiss not to mention Sex Criminals, written by Matt nice. Fraction, uh, drawn by Chip Zdarsky. This is the uh, book that's this crazy high concept about two people who can stop time when they have sex that's also the most refreshingly honest examination mm -hmm. of sexuality I have, the, I think, the, ever the, read. They kind of yeah. rob banks. Right, yeah, 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 they stop time and rob banks. Yeah. 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 But also, yeah, it, it talks about sex in such an honest, po uh, positive way that's very refreshing. And speaking of yeah. mental health, there's some really wonderful stuff there's about, some, like... Oh, God, yeah. depression and... Uh. Stop so, me if I should stop. No, we it's time. time. We, we got to stop. Oh, I, got, no. I got one more. I got one more thing. Uh, Ghostly Moose is how the comics creators who have their own books are being published by others get, uh, get copies to you guys. And as fans of comics, and you want what you want from your creators, what's important in comics? That's a whole episode. Yeah. Use the hashtag on Twitter. We'll probably see it. The Wednesday Club hashtag. If you want to, and we'll show make us a stuff. show out of it. And we'll we'll check we'll check some stuff out, and it's cool. And we're definitely going to talk about what creators can do. Uh, in the oh. meantime, this has been a fun episode. Oh, um, let's uh, let's go down the down the road. Who who's to my right? What are we? Pitching next no, week's just, episode? Oh, in next week's episode. We'll, we'll hit it when you hit it. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm Amy Dallin. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Ed Enthusiasm on Twitter. I'm Talison Jaffe at Executive Goth. I'm Erica Ishii at Erica Ishii. Uh, I'm Matt Key. I want to pitch Fabian Gray's uh, Five Ghosts of Fabian Gray. Didn't get to talk about it. Next week we are talking <laughs> about <laughs> Dr. Strange. <laughs> Dr. Strange. <laughs> I, am, I am taking over next week, and this is what I know best, so right. that is what we're doing. I'm going to be out next week because I'm working on a super secret project that's super cool, Ooh. but guys, it's been fun, and remember, if Inhibition has taught us anything, is that cool has its moment and fades away, but if you're making something that's fun, fun is forever. Thank you, everybody. Read a book. <laughs> 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 <laughs>